Welcome, folks. Uh, this is the Joint Justice Oversight Committee. Um, it is July 2nd. Um, I apologize. We are running a little late. Uh, we have to take care of some logistics here for the committee um, in terms of the cafeteria is closed today, so we have to figure out lunch because none of us knew the cafeteria would be closed. Um, and also, for folks who have been following along the Joint Justice Oversight Committee for a number of years, um, we spent a little bit of time here before we went on Zoom um, remembering our chair, Senator Dick Sears. Uh, Senator Sears passed away about six weeks ago. We were scheduled to have a meeting on June 11th that Senator Sears had organized and set up the agenda. We postponed that out of respect. And this is our first meeting uh, of this particular summer and fall. And um, I am vice chair of Justice Oversight, and we will be discussing later on today in terms of the leadership of our committee, how we move forward with that, um, but I do want to acknowledge publicly uh, the amount of work that Senator Sears has done for us here in the Joint Justice Oversight Committee, but not just here for us, but also for all folks in Vermont. Um, he, I've known and negotiated with Senator Sears for 30 years, and I have seen a person who is tough but as uh, Representative Topper, I think mean, Representative McFawn just mentioned that um, he can be a tough negotiator, but he does compromise for the good of the state. And, Rep and Senator Norris also spoke and uh, mentioned how much he's learned from Senator Sears and how walking into his committee room as a freshman senator was a little intimidating. <laughs> But um, <clears throat> a lot of knowledge uh, was transpired in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, the thing that I always admired about Senator Sears is he could bring such a complicated issue down into simple terms and simple words that people could understand. And, and that is a true gift. So we will continue our work this summer and fall um, with some goals that the senator uh, wanted to accomplish. We're going to depend on all of us here sitting around the table because we all work for Senator Sears in different ways so we can bring all of those interests and goals that he wanted for joint justice oversight for this year to be accomplished. So. Uh, with that said, anyone want to weigh in at all before we start? Uh, Madam. Yes. Uh, Madam Senator. Acting Chair, I will <laughs> say. <laughs> um, you know, one thing I did want to say while, while we were live about Senator Sears is just something that was driven home for a lot of us that uh, attended his memorial service in Bennington. Um, you know, first of all, that he did that drive so often, uh, you know, in sickness and in health was a huge sacrifice to the state, um, you know, for so many decades. And I'm sure he would have appreciated that we all had to take the five hour round trip drive <clears throat> to go down to pay our respects. Um, but much more importantly, you know, I think people might have known this who's, who served in his early days and watched him campaign, but many of us learned uh, at his memorial service that he was born in a women's prison, um, you know, to a mother who, uh, had to make the difficult choice to give him up for adoption uh, within that year. Um, and I think, you know, he didn't wear that on his sleeve in terms of telling his personal story, but he, it clearly, uh, it clearly permeated everything he did that some people are just handed a really difficult lot in life and they still deserve a second chance, um, you know, that, that everyone still has value and humanity um, and it's just amazing, you know, that without really needing to tell that story all the time or without, I think, many Vermonters knowing that story um, <clears throat> nowadays, you know, that he 
he really sought balance and to make sure that he wasn't on the side of victims or perpetrators, but that he was on the side of justice in everything that he did. Um, and so I'll just always remember that. And it was really a tremendous honor and privilege to get to work more closely with him in the Senate. Um, he's one of those people that I used to say, is he intimidating or am I just intimidated? <laughs> you know, and so um, it, it's wonderful. The more you get to know him, the more you realize he really is trying to be as, as unintimidating as possible, or he was. Um, and that was a gift for those of us who were able to sort of get past the gruff exterior. And I think uh, a lot of Vermonters just know how much he's contributed and will miss him greatly. We will miss him. I do on a personal level, <clears throat> miss him greatly. Um, so with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to our legal counsel, Ben Novogrosky. Uh, ben has been working on um, producing a document about our, over, our goals and responsibilities for the Justice Oversight uh, Committee for these next few weeks. So Ben, I'm gonna Turn it over to you. We do have a document that has, this document's been posted on that committee. I'm going to share my screen and go through it. Just bear with me one minute as I endeavor to do that. Senator Sears and my three years here so far, which I learned a lot and was uh, constantly impressed in his uh, willingness to see all viewpoints, bring in any witness that was requested or desired, and um, I think set a, was an exemplary example of being a chair and a true people senator. Thank you, ma'am. I will him as well. Um, but on that note, um, welcome to the 2024 interim of the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee. Um, I'll go over just a reminder of what the committee's charge is, the work ahead of the committee, reports and updates due to the committee, and then some further discussion points uh, for you all to consider. Um, so, just as a refresher, this uh, committee is established under 2 VSA Chapter 23, has various powers and duties. Um, it was an evolution, it originally was the Corrections Oversight Committee, and it has evolved to uh, be more than just that. Um, so, but with that um, origin, uh, its primary duty is to oversee uh, the Vermont Department of Corrections, evaluate the strategic operating capital plans, policy development, and ensuring communication between really everyone involved in the justice system. Um, DOC, the administrative branch, the criminal justice system, and also to assist with Vermont's juvenile and criminal justice system, including an evaluation of the statewide system of all pretrial services, diversion programs, really all restorative uh, justice approaches um, to identify any variations throughout the state, to assess uh, consistency and cost efficiency of the various systems of justice in the state, oops, um, ensuring that all statutes reflect restorative justice principles, which you'll see actually there's been a, there's been progress with, with that. And then reviewing timeliness of judicial proceedings, which um, as members of this committee know, the court backlog has been hanging over the state for a few years now, um, but um, I'm, I'm sure you'll hear from Judge Zoni, uh, progress has been made uh, cutting that backlog down. Um, so any questions about the purpose of the committee and the work to be done going forward? Um, <clears throat> just going over the work and reports due. Um, this is a lighter summer. Um, I would say it's more normal and routine because I think the last couple of summers have been quite, um, there's been quite a lot of work to do for this committee um, and not a lot of time to do it. So this is much more manageable from my perspective at least. 
Um, so there were two bills that were passed, S-195 and H-876, that were required work to be done by this committee. Um, Act 138 um, was related to bail and conditions of release um, and charged this committee with evaluating the new pretrial supervision program. Um, I'll get into details of what that review will be a little bit later. Um, Act 159 was the Corrections Miscellaneous Bill, and there's an earned time expansion review and recommendation that this committee needs to make um, because uh, earned time was much discussed in the House Corrections and Institutions Committee about expanding it to include parolees, um, to include educational credits to be credited towards uh, reduced sentences over time. So those will be the subjects of the study and, and I'll get into more detail of that uh, later as well. There are various reports and updates to the committee as well. So it's not so much work uh, per se, but it's reports and reviews that may prompt questions, uh, witnesses to be brought in, things of that nature. Um, Act 40 of last session, um, <clears throat> was, which started out as S14 and was entitled an act related to criminal justice related investments and expenditures. Um, there are two reports that came out of this, this act. Um, one is an annual report that's submitted by the Coordinated Justice Reform Advisory Council, which I'll describe in more detail later. And another, which is the first time that this is being reported, is really an assessment of Vermont's criminal justice related investments um, and trends resulting from those investments um, to really help uh, evaluate the effectiveness of the investments in Vermont's criminal justice systems and if they're leading to desirable outcomes. Um, and that, that report uh, is filed once every three years uh, because it tracks the recidivism calculation timeline in this state. So this is the first year of that um, and then the next one will be three years um, after that. Um, any question on the Act 40 reports or maybe wait till we get into more detail? Yeah, I'm just curious, when would they be due or set? I'll, I'll, get, I'll, yeah, I'll get into the details. Um, Act 125, which was S58, which was um, a much debated bill, um, but bi-monthly reports are due to the Committee on the Implementation of Progress Towards Raise the Age going into effect uh, next year. Um, and then in Act 180, which was at H645, um, this established pre-charge diversion in the state, and there's a study about uh, record retention. Um, who should be able to retain records? There was an exemption <coughs> carved out in the bill, or in the act, to exempt law enforcement and state's attorney's offices from having to, to, to delete records. Um, and this study was put in to see if, um, essentially to assess the appropriateness, and when, and what agencies should, um, be mandated to delete records or not. Um, so I'll get into the details of that report as well. Um, so with, without any questions, I'll, I'll move on. So just to be clear, in terms of what we are required, in terms of what we need to review, and then make recommendations to the next General Assembly, pertains to the issues within the pretrial supervision program mm -hmm. and that bill, as well as the earned time expansion. Those are the two issues. Exactly. And then the others, all the reports, we just have to hear the reports, but there's no requirement for any action on our part Correct. for that. But that's not to say if we do have some recommendations that we can do it, right? Right. Yeah, there's nothing restricting the committee from doing anything. There's just no requirement to do anything. The other thing I want to also bring, and Ben and I had this conversation there, is another issue within corrections that it's not required of us to make any recommendations. It's uh, keeping um, updated in terms of the replacement of the women's correctional facility. I know there's been a lot of work with members here in their respective committees about this. I know it's percolating that there uh, is interest in this. So could you um, bring us up to speed in terms of what the requirements are? Yeah, so on the, the new Women's Reentry and Correctional Facility, um, starting t uh, yesterday, actually, and going through January 1st, 
Um, quarterly reports from the commissioners of BGS and DOC are required um, to be submitted to the institutions committees um, regarding potential site locations of state-owned land and any progress on purchasing things uh, to either construct a facility or, or anything else kind of related to the development of the facility itself. Um, so <clears throat> no requirement that those are due to this committee, but members of this committee um, sit on standing committees that are receiving these quarterly reports. So that requirement started yesterday. Um, so that's, that's something else to keep on your radar. And then um, there's also the secure residential facility. Um, so this comes uh, essentially again, um, the department or BGS in consultation with the commissioner of mental health um, needs to report by February 1st of next year um, to various standing committees, the appropriations committees, the institutions committees, the health and welfare or health and uh, our health care committees um, all need to be reported to. Um, but that doesn't mean that this committee can't um, kind of keep tabs on things before that report is due in February. And that was uh, as a result of was it S-192, which was the forensic? No, that was in um, the Capitol bill. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's updating the secure residential facility Correct. to house folks who are, are high not risk. competent to stand trial. Right. But and there may, may need to be some construction work within that facility to meet the yes. uh, emergency and voluntary procedures. Right. And uh, there's a provision in that portion of the bill that says nothing shall be construed to prevent the development of a forensic facility in the future, but it's not really spoken to in the, in the bill itself, substantively. The other thing, too, and I think this is in S1, S876, wasn't it, in looking at um, shifting back to the women's replacement facility, kind of looking at um, the programming needs and the more internal structure? Yeah, not, um, it wasn't for this committee, it right. was for the institutions committee, right. but yes, it was basically site plans um, for the committee, uh, for the, the facility itself, how it would be structured, what services it would be, uh, would be housed, um, and so updates to the institutions committee um, are man mandated for that, but again, not outside the purview of what this committee does and doesn't need a mandate to oversee okay. that development. So I just want to put this on the table for folks because we're going to be talking later on today mm -hmm. when our next meetings will be and also what folks want on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that some folks would want to get an update in terms of where we are um, in replacing the women's facility. I would assume that. So I wanted to put that on the table so people can think about that for our next few meetings. Thoughts? Questions from folks? Anyone on Zoom? We can't see you. Um, can you see them, Megan? You can't. Can you? Okay. Anything else? So let's keep going. Oh, whoops. Um, just Rep Lalonde needs to drop his mom off, so he's yeah. going off. Yeah, Martin's gone. <coughs> I'll be back. Okay. So the work to do this summer, um, Act 138, this was S-195, the pretrial supervision program. It, it did a lot of other things too, but for our purposes, um, it established a pretrial supervision program um, that can be ordered by the courts and administered by the Department of Corrections. Um, essentially, if someone is deemed a significant risk to public safety or has not less than five uh, or more pending dockets against them, they are eligible to be placed into that program. And so there's a, a procedure about uh, where DOC would essentially do an investigation of the individual, submit a report to the court, and the court would use that to either um, order pretrial supervision 
uh, or not, um, of, of the defendant that meets those eligibility um, criteria after doing an assessment of what that risk would be or the, the dockets and the nature of the charges and there's a whole host of considerations in making the determination. Um, and also the, the type of supervision that can be um, ordered can range from automated telephone calls, just reminding people of court dates, to uh, you know, in-person phone calls, in-person meetings, um, Zoom or some other remote check-in or mm -hmm. anything else really that the department deems necessary um, to, to effectively supervise the, the individual subject in the program. Um, but uh, one issue within this was funding. And um, my memory is that there's about, I think it's $687,000 that was appropriated to this program. Um, about, don't quote me on that exact number. Um, but that is insufficient to operate the program statewide. Um, and so what this committee is charged with is to do a review of the program um, and provide recommendations to DSC for the most prudent use of those funds. And also to include recommendations concerning the, the areas in the state that the, part, that the department should first implement the program along with any future funding mechanisms for it. Um, so that's the focus of the, the, the study. These need to be submitted um, to the department by September 1st and then to the General Assembly by November 15th. The reason why that was staggered in such a way is because this program goes live before November. Um, and so it's basically the department needs those recommendations in order to bring it live and um, needs, need, needs the, that information to um, implement it in various areas uh, as recommended by the committee. Um, and then also it provides time for the department to then come back to the committee um, and explain what they may need for the budget next year. Um, and so that's why the November 15th deadline uh, exists, is to give enough time for the program to kind of work for a couple of months, um, see how it's used, see what they need, um, and then enough time for a bill request or, or draft to be submitted um, to either revise the program or to allocate certain money or to potentially even create new funding mechanisms for it. Um, so. That's essentially the, the charge on uh, coming from Act 138. Um, are there any questions on, on that study? So for the committee, this pre-trial supervision program is brand new. Yes. It does not exist now. It is when someone is arraigned, basically, and after arraignment, they haven't gone to trial. It's a new um, thought in terms of beefing up public safety when someone is, is out, they'd be out on bail. On bail or conditions of release. Or conditions of release. Um, those would all be set by the court. Um, part of that, part of their condition of release could also be um, electronic monitoring, if the court so chooses. But the big piece on this is DOC would now be doing the supervision in the community. That's the big shift. Right now, there's really no pretrial supervision program, and someone could be arraigned, they're released on conditions, and basically by default, it's your local law enforcement entities that would be enforcing those conditions. If they see a violation of those conditions, they bring the person back to the court. This sets up a new program that a DOC would do this supervision. And the concern that we heard in House Institutions Committee, and I think also probably Senate Judiciary heard this as well, from DOC was <clears throat> it's going to cost uh, much more money than the 600000 And um, I, think they, one, I think it was $1.2 $1.2, $1.5 million. 1 .2, 1 million, to put it in all their district office, field offices. So for 600000 or 687000 you basically may just have one 
field office that would be able to do this, maybe two. So the question is, for us, is we would be part of that decision making with DOC in terms of what part of the state would have these services to start up. Would it be in one spot, one county, or could we spread it between two or three counties with the 687,000? <clears> That's going to be our, our recommendation. So that the legislature is also part of this decision making, not just DOC. And then if, if it was just DOC, and then they didn't come forward with it, we could easily blame them for not carrying through the law. But if the legislature is also involved in that decision making, then we have a say in terms of where this would first get rolled out, what part of the state. Does that make sense for folks? So that's going to be our, our role in this. So I would say our next meeting in, in August, towards the end of August, I would assume, um, we need to get a preview. We need to have an understanding of what the pretrial supervision program is. Um, and then um, also discuss the dollar and um, where those could be expended. Because we'll have to make a recommendation at our August meeting. Bob? So we've got 60 days to submit to the department our recommendation. We're going to have one meeting in August, July, August, or September. Maybe in first. August we have to do it. Because <laughs> oh. September 1st, you need to submit the recommendation. Yeah, but I'm just saying that this whole lot of recommendation being submitted with only like one meeting going on here. And if memory serves me correct in the testimony that we heard, I believe there was originally 11, 11 to 12 positions. 12, 12, 12, 12 positions were originally West. statewide. DOC said we can't do that mm -hmm. on six hundred thousand dollars and change so i guess one of the points is how many positions would that encompass and i'm looking heavily toward doc's recommendations on this particular issue my recollection of what there is that the original ask was for 12 um uh, field officers two administrative support staff i think the 1.2 reflected having that number to six field officers and one support staff, and then the 687 doesn't even get us to that point. So, I mean, maybe three and, I don't know, half a support person, but, um, yeah, I'm being facetious. But, um, you know, that's sort of the numbers that were being worked with before, and unfortunately, we really only have one meeting before you make it. There were supposed to be two, but obviously we know why we delayed the, 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 June, the June meeting. Um, but this is really a continuation in a way of the discussions that were still ongoing really in the 11th hour of the, of the session. Um, and the bill itself did contemplate the scenario where you're not going to fund it statewide because in the bill there's a provision that says basically the court can't order this program unless it's funded. So there's not a mandate throughout the state to operate this program. There's not an unfunded mandate essentially. It's only it's only going to be operated by in, in the areas that are funded to do it. Um, and it seemed like, and I'm, I don't mean to speak on behalf of the department at all, um, and I defer to them, so please correct me, but it, it seems like they have a pretty good handle on what they need to implement the program. Um, there was a lot of discussion also within the committees of jurisdiction about really where the, for lack of a better term, problem areas in the state. Um, you know, I think there was a lot of discussion of Chittenden and Rutland counties, um, but obviously that can change depending on the committee's discussion. But the, I just want to give the committee sort of a lay of the land um, going into this. And these were the topics of discussion and the areas that were discussed um, ending the session and hopefully will be picked up now. Mm -hmm. We've got some work to do and I know we're getting an update from DOC shortly and maybe we can just kind of highlight this a little bit just to lay the groundwork for it because um, it's an important program but we may not be able to get it up, up and running as we had hoped. Uh, I know that Senator Lyons has come on board. We can't see anyone because... Do you want me to... I can stop sharing and that way we can... I'll pick up.
after if you want to break for just no, I think I think we're fine. I think Center Alliance, what we're going to do, we're going to continue um, going through what our charge is for this um, next few months. And then what we're going to do before we break for lunch, we're going to have a conversation in terms of how we proceed with the leadership of uh, the Joint Justice Committee. Uh, we had a little bit of discussion this morning, and the Senator, I think the committee is also thinking the same um, path as what you were thinking when you, you and I had a conversation at the end of last week. So we'll pick that up uh, before we break for lunch at 12. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, and thank you for being patient with my schedule this morning. Appreciate it. No problem. So Ben, why don't you keep going? Sure. Uh, so the next uh, task for the committee is from Act 159, which is the Corrections Miscellaneous Bill. Um, so coming from Section 3 of the bill, um, the committee is charged with reviewing whether the, the Department of Corrections current earned time program should be expanded to include parolees, as well as permitting earned time for educational credits for both offenders and parolees. So, the current earned time program is only for, um, doesn't apply to those that are out on community supervision. It's only those that are housed in a facility. And essentially, if they are on their good behavior, I believe for a period of a month, they can have up to a reduction of seven days um, of good, uh, from their sentence for that good behavior. And so the, the discussion now would be, do you expand that to parolees, so people that are still sub that are out in the community, subject to conditions that have been imposed by um, the, well, I guess it's imposed by the parole board, or at least monitored by the parole board, um, and whether or not there's a way to um, implement the current earn time program um, as applied to parolees. But there was a bill this year um, about educational credits. Um, this is modeled off of something that was implemented in Colorado last year, where essentially if someone, while they're housed in a facility, or uh, as contemplated by this bill, a parolee, um, if while they're um, incarcerated or under supervision, if they get some form of degree, either a, a trade certification or anything ranging from a bachelor's degree and beyond, um, if there should be a reduction of time associated with um, obtaining one of those certifications or degrees. Um, so that's the, the, the idea to, to research there. Um, uh, this review also needs to include an examination of the current operation and effectiveness of the DOC victim notification system and whether it has the capabilities to Here's handle what I found. such an expansion. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, and, uh, and really that comes from I think testimony that was received uh, this past session um, from the Center for Crime Victim Services and others um, where they're not necessarily notified um, when there's a reduction in, um, in time because of earned time. And so there was a concern raised that if there are currently problems in the program as it is, um, perhaps it's wise to address those before expanding it to others and to other uh, services. Um, and so that's something else that the committee would consider. And there's a mandate to solicit testimony from the department, from the center, uh, victims and survivors of crimes, including those that serve on the center's advisory board, um, and from the department of state's attorneys and sheriffs. Um, so those are all your, your featured guests, if you will, um, to talk about the victim notification system. And then this all needs to be done by November 15th of this year. Um, and it's not a requirement uh, to submit re recommendations, it's just if you have them, so it's any recommendations, uh, submit them to the Judiciary Committee um, and the House Committee on Corrections and Institutions. So in order to try to figure out how much time to schedule for two committee meetings or three committee meetings, how many folks are familiar with the current earned time program? That's what I thought. Because <laughs> I think in order to really understand this, you have to understand the current earned time program. So that's one thing we'll have to schedule in, just earned time 101, as I call it, because we have to understand. 
It, it depends on the detail that you're asking about, but I don't understand the details. I, I forget. I know we passed it, the legislation not that long ago. Um, it would be great to have a review. Yeah. But you have to understand those details. Because right now, yes. right now, firm time is only for folks who are incarcerated yeah. and folks who are on furlough. It's not yeah. for folks on parole. And we wanted it to also include folks on parole. The Senate did not agree with that. So they are looking to, to DOC um, whether or not it should be expanded to parole, folks on parole, and for us to also look at that. And the other piece is right now, for earned time, a person who's incarcerated or a person who's on furlough automatically receives seven days off for each month that they served, unless there is a major, is it a major DR for that? So the question is, if you add in educational credits, for folks, and the thinking was if they're on parole, let's offer them earned time, or more earned time possibly, if they're earning educational credits. So on the surface that may look, yes, that makes a lot of sense, but what about folks who are on furlough? And you're not doing that for folks who are on furlough. And what about folks who are incarcerated? You're not doing that for folks who are incarcerated. So that's what we'll have to weigh out for that. And then yeah. you throw in the, the victim issue as well. Well, we do the 101, and certainly my recommendations for those who may not be as familiar is to bring down a furlough, parolee. Everybody else with incarceration is a <laughs> probationer and all stuff here, so that we get a better understanding as yeah. yeah. to. We can do that too. We can lay that groundwork for that because you really need to understand the current mechanics of how it works before you get into whether or not it gets expanded. For that. So that can also be. And there are some thorny issues there as far as constitutional concerns with equal protection. Why are you treating one group differently than another? There needs to be a pretty good reason to do that. Okay. It's, it's pretty complicated. In some ways. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So with that, I'll move on to the reports and updates that are due. Um, so Act 40, uh, again, both of these reports are due November 15th, a uh, report on criminal justice related investments and trends. So this is, as I explained before, the first report since this legislation passed. It includes data showing trends in Vermont's criminal justice system and really is an attempt to assess the effectiveness of justice reinvestment too. Um, over the better part of a decade, if not longer, justice reinvestment has been um, implemented in two phases in this state um, and it's really focusing on rehabilitation um, you know diversions from the criminal justice system and this report is aimed to show indicators of success for those initiatives um, so specifically we talk about recidivism rates uh, clearance rates for so those would be things about whether cases have been closed by law enforcement, either through arrest, closed, or, or some other extenuating circumstance. Um, evidence of desistance. Um, desistance uh, essentially means uh, progress, for lack of a better term. So it's not that someone that hasn't uh, recidivated. It can be someone that maybe was charged with a domestic violence felony when they were younger, but then they've gotten to the point where they're only committing misdemeanor retail theft, that would be evidence of desistance because they've essentially, they're not committing as serious of crimes um, over the course of their, their life, essentially. So it's, it's a way to measure progress in that way. So there'll be indicators of that. There are going to be indicators of um, the money that um, has been uh, committed uh, under the JR2 umbrella towards transitional housing. Uh, drug programs, things of that nature. It's a very, very comprehensive report <clears throat> that's being spearheaded by um, uh, the Crime Research Group in consultation with many other stakeholders um, to get this right. And it's going to occur once every three years. Um, and this is going to be the first year of that um, to see 
if the things that the state has been doing for the past 10 plus years um, has shown signs of success and if the investments have been worth it, essentially. Um, relatedly, there, Act 40 also created the Coordinated Justice Reform Advisory Council. The purpose of the council is really to establish a unified and collaborative approach to support restorative justice providers um, and to make sure that um, the, uh, the programs and services that are implemented are consistent with the state's restorative justice policy, which is in uh, 28 VSA Section 2A. Um, and this is, think of the, the, the council here as really the next phase of justice reinvestment. Justice reinvestment was um, managed and implemented by the Council of State Governments, of which Senator Sears served on the board. Um, and uh, they, there's quite a close relationship with them, but their role in this has, has finished. Um, and so this is the next step of the state essentially taking the mantle over um, to keep overseeing those initiatives and either improving them, changing course, or whatever the, the, the council shall decide. Um, and what their report does here um, is they have to provide considerations and recommendations to, sustain, to establish a sustainable planning and funding structure to administer those community-based programs and restorative justice providers, um, along with modern data collection systems. So as you'll hear um, from the H645 report, um, these providers are all funded through grants. And right now those grants are issued through the Department of Corrections. H645 changed that so that the majority of those providers are now going to be um, issued grants from the Attorney General's office. Um, but the problem with grants, as you will hear the providers themselves testify to, is that it's really hard to plan year to year when costs go up and baseline funding isn't truly baseline funding anymore because of those cost increases in inflation. And it's really hard to plan for staff, um, numbers, uh, salaries, programs, services when you're living year to year not really knowing how much money you're going to get and whether that money is even enough uh, to operate as you did in the year past. So um, these are funding issues that um, this council is supposed to assess and will submit a report to all of you um, on what they find, if, if anything. Um, the second portion of the report is to submit recommendations to the Commission of Corrections for the appropriate allocation of not more than $900,000 from the Justice Reinvestment to line item of the DOC budget uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. And this would be to support those restorative justice providers and programs, uh, the data collection and analysis and other initiatives consistent with the purpose of the council. This recommendation is due to the commissioner in September so that that can then be rolled in to the commissioner's budget ask um, that, uh, that you'll see in the governor's uh, uh, proposal come the beginning of next session. Um, however, it's merely a recommendation. It can be changed. It can be not withstood. But it was a nod essentially to say this is what the legislative, mem or no, this is what the, the stakeholders think is the appropriate use of the money, but ultimately it's DOC's um, proposal. Uh, so those are the two things that will come to this committee in that report. So the broad, real broad understanding of justice reinvestment and the work that we've done as a state with the Council of State Governments on this is looking at the driving forces in terms of our incarcerated beds, people who are coming into the correctional system, our facilities, and serving their sentence and then re-entering into the community. And where those points are that are exacerbating <clears throat> the correctional system, what are the drivers that are bringing folks into our correctional facilities what are the drivers when a person is <coughs> entering the community and they come back into an incarcerated setting? So the work that the Council of State Governments did, they highlighted some certain areas. And in Justice Reinvestment 2 in particular, 
where this 900,000 is specifically to go, what Council of State Governments highlighted is, particularly on the reentry piece, when a person is either on furlough, or they could be on parole, um, those support services that are needed for the person to succeed out in the community from our community partners. It could be supportive housing, it could be mental health um, treatment, it could be substance abuse treatment, uh, transitional housing, those type of things. What the Council of State Governments found was that DOC was picking up the tab on this. They were paying for it when it should be our community partners should be paying for the services. So that was the goal that in theory, for justice reinvestment, it costs X amount for an incarcerated bid. If, if you can invest that money into your partners, community partners, out in the community to provide those services instead of the DOC nickel, it's going to save DOC dollars in the long run. And it's going to, because we're not going to need as many beds. That's the thinking. You invest those dollars that you have saved on the bed, you invest that back out into the community. That's the thinking for justice reinvestment. And is it working or not? We don't know. And we're going to get some testimony this afternoon from our joint fiscal office in terms of what monies have been put for justice reinvestment to over the last couple of years. Yeah, and just to kind of elaborate a little bit more on the topics that are covered in this report, there's, you know, I mentioned recidivism, evidence of desistance, but it, it goes beyond that. I mean, it's returns to incarceration from community supervision. Um, that includes data points on what type of community supervision, um, be it probation, parole, or furlough, um, an indication if a return was for a violation of one of those supervision statuses or for a new crime, um, if it was considered a significant um, or non-significant violent and non-violent crime, um, any available demographic information. Um, it's also going to include bail rates, including detainees who are held without bail, held with bail, um, the monetary amounts, and those who post bail and are released. Um, also, pretrial detainees, held in Vermont, um, classified by crime type and the jurisdiction that, in which they're held, um, and then the, the, the funding for and utilization of substance use disorder treatment, mental health, educational, and vocational initiatives for incarcerated folks, and then the funding for JR2, um, which covers domestic violence intervention programming within DOC, including the results from the evaluation framework that the Vermont Network Against Domestic Violence has partnered with the Uni University of Nebraska to develop, um, offender transitional housing capacity, advancements to the DOC's data collection systems, um, agencies, departments, and other organizations who employ restorative justice principles, including community justice centers, and any other expenditures from the general fund for these initiatives. And then specifically on the out-of-state beds point, it will highlight information um, from DOC out-of-state beds that were contracted for by the department and the average cost of that bed from fiscal year 19 and for each year after, um, as well as DOC's in-state beds, which would be separated by gender, including specialty units, so units like there's an infirmary or um, maybe a mental health unit, um, and then units that were closed or unavailable in a given fiscal year, again, from fiscal year 19 on. So these are the data points. It's going to be a lot of information um, to help you all assess, in addition to various other people that will be receiving this report, report um, about really what the state's been doing. And the state's been achieving our goal. <coughs> That's really going to be the key. Are we achieving our goal or not? So Act 125, which was S58, uh, bi-monthly reports on the raised age implementation. Um, so from Section 12 of the bill, uh, on or before the last day of every other month from
from July, so this month, through March of next year, AHS shall report to this committee, um, the Judiciary Committees, uh, HCI and uh, Committee on Human Services and the Senate Committee on Health and Welfare on its progress towards implementing the requirements of sections 7 through 11 of this act, which is really just raise the age initiatives, um, which is scheduled to take effect in April of next year. So um, it would start the end of this month and then two months after that. So that would be what, the end of September um, and then the end of November. Uh, for those bi-monthly reports on, on the progress made towards uh, implementing the initiative. We should really be scheduling our next meeting in August to cover this. Mm -hmm. And then we have to go do it again in September. I mean, these are just progress reports. So, I mean, you it's, it's up to the discretion of the committee to actually schedule time here or if you just want to receive the reports. Um, it doesn't, however, it does not specify that they need to be written. Um, so that might be a point of inquiry is to see how are these reports being prepared? Is it intended just to be an oral presentation or is it going to be something that you could just look at? I see no questions, I'll move on uh, to Act 180, which was H645. Um, this is the record retention reports for pre-charge diversion. Um, so in the new pre-charge diversion statute, um, to explain what pre-charge diversion is, it's um, under the current diversion program, you have to actually be arraigned before you are referred to diversion. This establishes a process where you don't need to be arraigned, but there needs to be evidence of probable cause as assessed by either a law enforcement officer or a prosecutor, um, basically to make sure that there's enough evidence of a crime, you're not just referring people for no reason, um, to restorative justice providers. Um, and if those people successfully complete the restorative justice programming or the diversion program, their records can be deleted, um, which think of it as akin to expungement, except there's no court order in this process, because um, when you have been arraigned, you're subject to the jurisdiction of the courts. So rather than having the courts issue the, an expungement order, you're having the Attorney General's office issue a deletion order um, since they are managing the diversion programs. Um, and so if they satisfactorily complete their programs, they notify um, the, the providers and the powers that be within 30 days of completion, and then two years after that successful completion, Records can be deleted if there have been no other incidents in, in, during that time. Um, and But there are two carve-outs for the deletion for prosecutors and law enforcement agencies. Um, basically, prosecutors were carved out so that they could meet their Brady obligations. So under Brady and Giglio, um, all exculpatory evidence needs to be disclosed in a case and any um, impeachment material as well. And that, and that, that includes uh, law enforcement officers that may have um, had allegations of impropriety against them. That's something that is an ongoing obligation of a prosecutor in a court case. So if Officer X years ago did something that was improper and he was on this new case that's being prosecuted, that information would need to be disclosed. Um, there was testimony that prosecutors could be hamstrung if they had to delete records um, of diversion that may include an officer's records or things of that nature. Um, and so that's also why law enforcement itself um, is exempted, um, but only for private databases. So anything that's public facing gets deleted. They only can retain private databases of their own reports and records. Um, but with that in mind, there was a lot of discussion about, well, is that really appropriate long term since this is a new program? And so as a result, on or before November 15th, um, the Sentencing Commission shall submit a written report reviewing the current record retention practices of the pre-charge program uh, within law enforcement agencies and state's attorney's offices, and then provide the following recommendations, whether pre-charge diversion records are retained, sealed, made available on a limited basis to law enforcement or prosecutors, or deleted altogether. If it's recommended that the records be retained, a determination of any time limits or other restrictions, related to such retention, if it's recommended that the records be sealed, 
um, a determination of the circumstances that would permit such sealing, and if it's recommended that records be made available on a limited basis and the circumstances as well. Um, and then finally, if records should be deleted and a determination of any time lapse or other considerations for prior deletion. So you see sort of the scaling. You gotta either keep them or <clears throat> keep them for a certain amount of time or you seal them and you seal them for a certain amount of time or they're just gonna be available for a certain amount of time or they're deleted but have to be retained for a certain amount of time. Um, and we can get into the differences of, I mean, expungement itself um, and think of it as lesion is as if the event or crime never occurred. Sealing is that it's not discoverable except by certain authorized agencies. Um, and then, uh, so those are sort of the, the terms of art there that we'll get more into as, um, you know, if, if uh, the committee desires once receiving the report. And I know Senator Lawrence has a question prior to that. that I'm going to be depending a lot on our Judiciary Committee members on this because this is all more in their world than some of our world that we're familiar with. So, heads up, be prepared. <laughs> so, Senator Lyons? No, as you, yes, as, um, as Ben is uh, going through all of this, and I'm including some of the prior discussion, there's a lot of information here regarding uh, the availability of community services. So including in the pre-charge diversion program, uh, this is more about reporting um, current records and retention practices that just does belong more in the judiciary environment. But we've also talking about mental health services, substance use disorders, um, services and AHS will be reporting to us. So I think it's absolutely key that as there's any discussion about any expansion of services or, or how are we meeting our current need for pre-charge uh, diversion. Uh, just, just a heads up for us, I think w the demand is very great right now in the community, and it would be good to know who is available and who is providing those services, and what, um, what pressures are they under, if any. So, and, and Senator Lyons, on that note, um, you know, I have information, and I know Amy Pope um, has information on a list of all the providers. I do know that there's been in con there's been contact with DOC, the Attorney General's Office, and DCF. They're they're all the entities that essentially handle these issues um, or or oversee them rather. Um, and uh, one another thing that came out of this act um, that isn't necessarily before this committee explicitly is that the Attorney General's <coughs> Office is charged with data collection because there isn't a lot of good data about from the providers themselves about the number of referrals that they handle each year, the, the, the rates of success, um, rates of failure, um, who and, and what are uh, being rehabilitated in, in these programs. So this is, a, there are reports that are gonna be submitted to the various judiciary committees at least on that information. Um, I believe, I wanna say it's in January of each year, um, but it's in the bill and there will be more data. It just isn't necessarily mandated to come before this committee. Um, but it's, uh, as you can sense a theme in this presentation, there's a lot of data collection going on right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in an effort to assess the successes of what the state's been doing. Or failures. Right. No, thank you. I, I mean, it does have implications for the um, organizations in our local uh, towns and municipalities that are providing some of these services so that the data will be extremely helpful. So that's the end of reports and work due, but I wanted to create a slide on considerations moving forward this year and next year. Um, so H645 did mandate some reports due to this committee during the 2025 interim. This is mostly for me as a placeholder, so I don't forget about it next year when I go back and look at this presentation, but figured I'd throw it in here for you all as well. Um, and this is another thing having to do with um, once somebody has been adjudicated, found guilty and sentenced, um, what are some sentencing options that can be imposed 
that are restorative and reparative in nature. And so there was a post adjudication working group uh, convened to make those assessments and recommendations um, July 15th of next year with a report due uh, on November 15th of next year. Um, another one was a study on criminal, criminal record sealing. Um, this was a, was a priority of Senator Sears that I know um, he was very adamant about this past session. I think uh, Representative Alone can probably speak to um, the passion with which he wanted uh, to, to study this. Um, but this was something, again, um, in his honor, essentially, for the committee to consider as a work to explore and is related to the H645 study about record retention, mm -hmm. since sealing is one of the considerations that um, can be contemplated. Um, and then <coughs> other, any other priorities that are hanging out there from the committee, we, we recommended or we discussed earlier the forensic facility, the secure residential facility, um, so those are, those are other things as well. We'll have some time as well in the committee to talk about what are some of our other priorities so that we can start scheduling that up. And then last but not least, just a quick reference of the schedule for the summer. And that's the other thing we'll do today before we leave. Just try to figure out uh, when we should meet again. I would suggest probably towards the end of August, get through the primary season and then go from there. Um, but we need to figure out what days of the week. I know for some folks certain days don't work and that would be really helpful to have that before we send out a little poll. Anything else for Ben before we move on for updates from DOC, which is going to be a little complicated, but okay. we just had lunch delivered here, so we can go over 12 o'clock. Anything else for Ben? Um, Madam, yeah. Madam Chair, um, so I just, in terms of the en big picture of anything else, I was starting to write you an email, but I thought I'd just say it so it doesn't get lost. Um, you know, Senator Sears and I were having lots of conversations about um, different ways to keep people from having <clears throat> sentences that might not fit the level of crime. We talked about ending life without parole. And in that conversation, um, he said, you know, that he felt, and I don't want to, you know, try to revive his words exactly, but that, um, you know, more important to him or just thinking about more people impacted was three strikes laws. Um, and I, I just plan to sort of look into that more. Um, I don't know if, if, uh, okay. um, if Senator Norris or anyone who was on judiciary with him heard him talk about that, but he was becoming very interested in people who might be, um, over sentenced or sort of sitting in jail without rehabilitation because of three strikes provisions. We don't have three strikes, you're out. And we, we, we have, is it, um, we do have something, what is it called, repeat offender? Habitual. What is it? Habitual offender. Habitual oh, offender. Habitual yeah. offender. Yeah. yeah. Let Which me find, is. yeah, I'll find his email and forward it. Because it was, if you're right, it wasn't articulated that way, but, um, this is where I'm not on the Judiciary Committee, but, you know, I'm trying to sort of reflect back one of our final conversations about, you know, people he was worried about um, as a population in jail. So I'll look for that email and I'll forward it to some of you. What, was he talking about folks who were pre-trial and, uh, uh, and and being kept in uh, depart by the Department of Corrections? Because that was, was a concern. It, I mean, that probably was for him, too. And again, we don't yeah. want to sort of like overstate where he yeah. was, but I'll find the email. So I'm really specific. It was definitely post trial, post sentencing people who are oh. um, sort of, you know, are we worried they're just sort of in in prison? And he said he was always sympathetic to the life without parole piece, but he was more concerned about this larger group of folks that, um, you know, may have been sentenced beyond the nature of the last crime they committed. And I'll find the email. 
Yeah, if you could find that email, that would be very helpful and send it to all of us in the committee as well as Ben, so that mm -hmm. we can kind of figure out what was the concern. Will do. Anything else for Ben before we move on to DOC here? Okay, thank you, Ben. We got our work cut out for us. It's not as heavy as in the past, but it's heavy. Out of the hot seat, though. Mm -hmm. Out of the hot seat, though. Out of the hot seat. Yeah, we'll put, we'll put either Al or Isaac or somebody. I think Al will go together. We got more hot seats now. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll spread the warmth around. So there is a document that you have, and also I'm sure that uh, there might be some questions coming from the committee because I know with the hot weather that happened a couple of weeks ago and the situation that happened with some of our correctional staff that members might want some clarity on as well. And so welcome. And um, we can go a little bit beyond 12 o'clock if we need to. We're seeing that we had our lunch brought in. And uh, so I'll turn it over to both of you folks, and if you could just identify yourself for the record. Sure, I'm Kristen Calvary, Deputy Commissioner for my DOC. Al Pender, Chief of Operations for the Department of Corrections. Okay, which one of you is going to be first? Can we can talk about the, uh, the population overview, first slide, okay. first couple of slides, just to, to kind of set the, the base for where we're at right now with our, with our population. Um, with this slide, you'll see we're starting to see a slight increase of our, our numbers. Um, both pre COVID, we see where they dropped drastically. Um, in the last, last 10 years, we've seen quite a decrease. Um, the numbers we start to see increasing, though, are those um, detainee numbers starting to, to rise again. 548? That's yes. the highest we've ever been. Absolutely. So when we were here in the building over the session, it was running around 425, 450. So is this a seasonal bump? Or a no, you'll, you'll see that it's, it's started, you know, mid-2021, 2022, it's really started climbing up, and I wouldn't consider it a seasonal bump. I think it's, it's a, a, a reflection of the courts finally starting to open back up, mm -hmm. um, getting back to more regularly scheduled arraignments. Um, we're seeing that, that population come into our facilities. And our population is now over 1,400. Now these include, this includes the out-of-state beds yes, as well. Does, yes. And this is our whole <coughs> system now, female. Correct, correct. How many, do you have it broken down by how many detainees are in the women's facility? Mm -hmm. um, not in those slides, but we have 520 detainees. 440 state detainers and 80 are federal. Say so that again, this question. Sure. 520 total detainees. Yeah. 440 are state detainees. Yeah. And 80 are federal. Okay. And uh, so you don't have it broken down. What's how many of the 440 are women? 53 of them are women. Thank, Thank you. Three. And what's your population in Chittenden right now? 117. Okay. Who's the first one? The 520? 520 total detainees. So half of the women's population, pretty much, are detainees. Yes. And even in the male population, that 909 that are total sentence. Those are just state and our Mississippi folks. That's Correct. not including federal folks that might be. Right. We, we have no state or no federally sentence individuals, just right. detainees. Just detainees. So of the 440 state detainees, that's almost half, not quite half of our incarcerated population Correct. of detainees. That's always been a concern is the increase in our detainee population. Is there 
uh, a little deeper dive in terms of those detainee numbers that some of those folks are already sentenced and they've um, <coughs> created a new offense and are being detained? Would they be considered a detainee? So 92% 90, of our detainee population is felony level detainees. 94% um, of, of the sentence population are felonies. 60% of the detainee population is uh, big 12 offense, aggravated assault, sexual assault, murder, felony, serious, what we classify them as. So if a person has an underlying sentence, say they've been on furlough, mm -hmm. and they're on parole, and there's a new offense, and then they're reincarcerated, are they considered a detainee or are they considered incarcerated? Both. Both. We, we, we can, the, the status we call them is a sentence detainee. So um, would they show up in that 440? They would show up in the, yes, the 440 is part of that detainee. No, the 440 is straight detainee. Straight detainee. Stra no sentence. First time we're Correct. incarcerated. Yeah. Jive with the discussion about somebody was worried about people that were in prison. The one that Keisha brought up yeah. in terms of what's their length of sentence based in yeah. terms of the crime that they committed. Right. If if ninety four percent of felons. That's why I think it's important for her to send that email. Yeah. So okay. we can refine right. that to see a little bit more. Okay. Right. We, we can certainly break down that sentencing information too as to what the sentence structures are based on the different charges. If folks if folks want to do any deeper dive on any of this, we can do that. We just need to, to know so that we can schedule the time for that. Just a point of information from the committee, um, <clears throat> without knowing what that email is, the vast majority of criminal laws in this state don't have, um, they, they state a range of sentencing. There aren't like uh, mandatory minimums or anything like that. Um, typically there's a, just a cap on it, and so it leaves the judge a lot of discretion given various factors. Uh, to uh, to consider. So it could be a minimum of 10 years and that's going to be 10 Yeah, years and I, I believe I've only seen a minimum of that when it comes to like homicide related crimes. Um, but most of the time it's just, you know, not more than three years in prison and a fine of $1,000 or both. Um, that's typically how the, the, the general structure of our criminal statutes are. Um, so it just puts a cap and then doesn't really necessarily have a mandatory minimum. Uh, the other thing to consider too is, um, I, I asked Haley this uh, on the side, but H645 created the pretrial supervision program and also an expansion of home detention, which was specifically meant to keep people out of prison. Um, and so that might be something to consider when analyzing these numbers. Uh, the, home, the new home detention expansion is only for those who, uh, not only those who can't make bail, which was the current program, but was expanded to those who pose a significant risk to public safety. Um, and that went into effect June 1st. So we're only about a month in of that program, so I, I'm, I don't know if it's had any effect, but that's 
maybe a point of inquiry to keep track on of throughout the summer. Currently, six, six individuals on home detention statewide. Well, you went up. We had four back in the day. Now you went up. On the rise. It's on the rise. So the goal of home detention is not to take up an incarcerated bed. They're detainees, but they're out in the community, they're in an appropriate housing, and, they, and they're monitored with electronic monitoring. And they're overseen by the Department of Corrections. Okay. <laughs> Did you forget your question? <laughs> no, I just remembered it. Um, do we have an accurate figure on the uh, number of individuals of color that are here in the state of Vermont? That are incarcerated? Well, I believe so. No, not incarcerated. Oh. I'm just the, the population. Yeah, no, is, is because it's in here it says 17 4 percent people of color. But yeah, um, I don't know that off the top of my head. I do know it exists, but I, I is do it know. Is it 6% of our population, or is it 1%? That, that seems high to me. Yes. 1%? I do know anecdotally that we are considered the whitest state in the country. Yes, no. um, I, 3%? Chair, I can chime in a little bit. I think one of the major drivers of that discrepancy is that we are in Vermont incarcerating any, you know, anyone who the court has sent us, um, and they may not be a resident of the state of Vermont. So it's not uncommon for folks, um, and it's, it's disproportionately folks who are out-of-state residents who are incarcerated in Vermont are more likely to be individuals of color. There's a lot, there's a lot of what I would consider epidemiological type information that would be helpful here. And, uh, you know, I think Topper's comment has raised it that, that might include uh, how many of these uh, charges or convictions are related to um, uh, drug sales, distribution. Um, so, what types of what types of charges um, are we looking at? I see the aggravated assault and sexual assault, but was there are any of these um, drug related? Uh, just just trying to sort out. Where yeah, they're happening. Yeah, yeah. We'll show that when it when it's mm -hmm. when it's um, Yeah, I didn't know if, if that there was more to answer Ginny's question, but um you know, I just want to say people of color is not a race. Um, you know, we really need to know how many black people are incarcerated, how many black men particularly. Um, those are really different statistics than just saying white and people of color. Um, that, that information is available on the DOC website as well, and it is linked below. And it will also be yeah. included in the Act 40 report, and it's based off of any available demographic information because there was a lot of testimony just about different capabilities of different agencies to gather that information. And then there's an added complication to that data point, which is, is it perceived race? or actual race, um, and I, I believe that the Act 40 report is based off of perceived race of the of the officer. Um, right. So it's, you know, data can largely be imperfect, but it's also sort of the best that the state has at the moment. Yeah, I, I completely agree, and I, I was there for, you know, ensuring that we did perceived race, um, because that's still very critical information. Um, and, you know, when we know that places in Southern Vermont pull over in, in Brattleboro, for example, we heard nine times, uh, more black men are pulled over than white men. And in Bennington, we've heard that 75% of those pulled over are black men. Um, you know, when we just hear, oh, they're from out of state, it just really concerns me that we're not getting to that epide epidemiological level of, understanding, you know, what patterns exist here, and especially just saying people of color doesn't do much for our our oversight process. Chair, we'd be happy to bring in more information on this, Senator. I think also th these would be good questions for law enforcement, state's attorneys, and the courts as well. Yeah, because you're the back end of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And we can give you the information for folks currently in custody, but for other 
populations who are criminally you know, involved in the legal system. That's really beyond our jurisdiction. And, and on that point, the entity that was charged with really gathering all these pieces of information together, so this is not the Act 40 report, which will show that as well, is um, the Office of Racial Equity. Uh, two years ago, they, they've been charged with really surveying state government and pulling all these different data sets together to show a truer picture. So that, that, that's another resource as well to go to. Um, because they, they theoretically have been doing that for a couple of years now. I don't want to lose sight of my other question regarding involvement with drugs, drugs distrib distribution, and then in addition, any of those charges related to mental health issues and mental health needs. That's a significant issue right now. Um, so uh, th that information is also critically important. So some of that information is available on our website. And I would just note 3.4% okay. of our population right now is incarcerated for uh, drug charges, and they're all felonies. 3.4%. Yeah. What about age distribution? And I'm sure, sure you have that as well. Yep. If you follow that link below, there's there's a lot of information yeah. to display. Okay. So, Got it. Speaking and again, certain lines that that will be in the Act 40 report as well. All all of that breakdown. Oh, that's so something to look forward to. <laughs> and that comes when in November. I believe so. It'll <laughs> be Christmas gifts. Nice Thanksgiving discussion. <laughs> Thanksgiving discussion. Just a quick question. When you say 3.4% of the yes. population, what's the hard number on that? here but um, there are other charges oftentimes involved as well and so you know perhaps a aggravated assault might be the driving charge in that particular instance same with mental health as well Four priorities, um, those being staff and staffing, health and wellness, diversity, equity, and inclusion for a just system, and modernization of our system. Um, each of those priorities has a steering committee attached to it. The steering committee is going to be responsible for um, engaging with, with our staff and community partners in, in meeting the goals and objectives of our strategic plan. Um, the strategic plan is basically our roadmap for the next six years taking us to 2030. Um, again, the, we've, the, the, the plan was built with input from our staff from the ground up. We, we brought in staff from across the department, uh, created focus group or work groups, and those work groups created our plan. We brought that out to the, the field and facilities, created focus groups, took that feedback <coughs> from those staff, created the final plan that you have in front of you. Um, and now we're, we're engaging our staff with, with that work. 
work. The, the intent of this plan is to really streamline what the department is doing and, and give us a document that we can refer back to um, for any goals or initiatives, projects that, that we may become involved with that we can tie back to our plan. Um, you know, the, the modernization is a big one as we talked about in the women's facility. We talked about Wi-Fi in our facility, which is a, a major hindrance to modernizing a lot of the work that we're trying to do, whether it be federal management system, electronic log books for our staff, um, updated camera systems, uh, monitoring systems, and so forth. Um, and that also impacts the health and wellness. The health and wellness of our population is a priority um, when it comes to health care and, again, modernizing our system. So there's an over overlap with many of these with one another. Um, the staff and staffing and modernization fall heavily upon one another, uh, but the goal of those steering committees is to ensure that there is a collaboration of services, not a duplication of services. So we want to ensure that two different work committees aren't doing the same thing, that they're, they're communicating and talking and streamlining the process as we, as we roll this out. So who makes up the individual steering committees? Is it, is it just central office folks, or is it also including correctional officers, administrators, superintendents, field office folks? Who yes. makes up the steering so committees? So the, the, the steering committees are headed by uh, four individuals. Kristen is overseeing the health and wellness steering committee. Isaac has the modernization steering committee. Jim Rice, our director of Office of Professional Standards and Compliance, has our staff and staffing. Um, and then the diversity and equity and inclusion priority is overseen by Glenn Boyd, a district manager in Burlington PNP. The chairs of those committees then have six, around, I think we're at approximately six individuals on each steering committee that are made up of district managers, superintendents, and uh, division directors from our central office. So we intentionally created the steering committees of higher level staff that can really um, they, they can come together and bring those work groups together from the supervisory manager and line level staff as we roll these, these work groups out. And how long have they been in, in this? Did they just get formed? Just, just barely formed. We have a meeting next week um, with the entirety of those steering committees to talk about uh, our goals going forward and, and what work groups and, and the planning may look like as we move this forward. And will those steering committees, will line staff, your field officers as well as your correctional officers have access to these steering committee yes. members? So if they see something, they can go to the respective steering committee? Yes. Yep. Um, I think one of the big things for us is the, the staff built this plan. It wasn't figureheads at central office just saying this is what we need to do. The staff built this for us. And I think it's important that the staff roll this out as well, that their, their voice is heard, because they're the ones that are going to be impacted the most by this. So they, they will certainly have a seat at the table and a voice at the table when, uh, when we do this. And, and the intent is not to create additional work, because for a lot of this, the work is already happening. Mm -hmm. um, it's involved in our pretrial supervision pilot that we're, we're going to be talking more about. Um, it's involved in our, our OMS upgrades and, and development. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna use this as the work and, and hopefully decommission some work. That's mm -hmm. we've historically been really good at, about creating work but not taking work away. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that as, as we talk about modernizing the system, we can eliminate a lot of the unnecessary paperwork and then processes that we, we currently do in a in a more streamlined okay. fashion. I, I know that we're gonna get some kind of a report from uh, the agency that's providing the health care services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 health care is going to be an issue. Yeah. Um, so, so we are going to get that, right? <clears throat> I know Senator Ryan's shared with me. We're going to talk later on today in terms of <clears throat> what other items we want to schedule testimony on. And I know health care is one of those issues. Yeah, okay. I got I've got some follow-up questions that I want to make sure from the last maybe three or four meetings that we had to find out what's happening now in terms of 
drugs being provided to people in the prison appropriately, and then the transition coming out of the prison, making sure. We did that. Yeah. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh. That's that was an the eight. point of a lot of discussion in yeah, the House Corrections Institution it came out of 876. Yeah, right. um, to, to revise and revamp and so now what the mandate is is that the provider well path or facility um, if someone is receiving uh, prescription drugs so non substance abuse treatment just any prescription right. um, they within the before they leave this facility they need to be I believe supplied with up to 28 days of supply in hand with uh, a voucher to redeem uh, a prescription in the community once the supply has been depleted. Um, they also have, um, can be put in contact with um, <coughs> healthcare providers in the community. There's sort of a, like a case manager, for lack of a better right. term, mandate to help coordinate and schedule those things. And then for the opioid use, use treatment drugs, um, I believe that that was also bumped up to not more than 28 days. Or no. was it legally permissible? Legally supply. permissible legally. supply. Yes. Um, until they can hook in with a hook. Until they, yeah, exactly. So it's whatever is medically prescribed and is deemed sufficient by the, right. the, the, the physician. Um, and then similar language about coordinating with uh, in treatment centers, uh, rehab, uh, what, what have you. So, and that's all, that's all well and good. And, and I, I know about that. What I want to know is from people that have come out of the prison that that is actually happening. Mm -hmm. Because we were told before, oh, this is happening, but then we found out it wasn't. So I want to make sure. Yeah, that's going to take some time to get that kind of testimony because well, this only became just effective to... July 1st. Right, yeah. And, and there is language, sort of qualifying language, that if the supply is available, um, because one of the concerns that was raised in testimony was the ability to actually obtain some of these drugs yeah. by the provider. Um, because, I mean, I, anecdotally in the news, you can see that there are drug supply shortages, and so that's something that was accounted for. So there is almost an out, if you will, that if they can't get the supply, they're not going to be mandated to provide those to the people re entering uh, the community just because they can't get them. So, what happens? <clears throat> What happens to that person? Well, they do a prescription. They have to have a prescription. And there's also what is it? The, 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 the 10, 11, 15 waiver that's being worked on right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I don't know, Isaac, you probably can speak better. So the no, we actually have that queued up in there. Okay. Well, we're going to spend more okay. time on the healthcare. Yeah. But the issue, too, Tucker and other folks, I have to be that this came out in testimony before our committee when we were looking at the re entry piece for prescriptions. Right. And WellPath has in their contract that they provide right. up to, they provide a 30 day supply, however that gets done. Right. The issue that really came to light in our committee is that's all well and good if someone's incarcerated, they have a sentence, and they're due to go out on furlough or they're due to go out on parole. DOC and WellPath knows that there's a certain time there that they have to get this done. If there's a detainee, and the person goes to court, they could be released from court. Wellpath and DOC has no clue. So if they're a detainee and they're on medication, they wouldn't have that 30-day supply because DOC is not in control. The person would be released from court and never seen again back in the facility. Yes, and, and so we knew about that. And that's, that is more of an issue that's harder to get your hands around that. Right. And we know about that. With all due respect, I thought we were going to try to figure out how to fix that. For the detainees, it's very difficult. We fixed it for folks who are incarcerated mm -hmm. and are sentenced. But the detainee population is difficult because they're there for a few days or they're there for a couple months or they could be there for a year or two. They go to court and then they're released. And the judge releases them. Yeah. And there was testimony, too, that really I think a loose marker of time is like it takes kind of six months, I believe was the testimony, to really make these assessments and get what you need for these people. So if there's someone that's just there over the weekend before they get rain, there's not enough time to, there's enough 
logistically do everything you need to do to get them what they need. Well, okay. So we'll do it. We'll, we'll do it. We'll, we'll give more testimony on that. But those are some of the nuances. So when you hear from constituents and say, I can't get my meds, the first question that we should really ask as a legislator is what's their status? Are they, were they a detainee? Or were they sentenced? Are they out on furlough or parole? Because then that gives you a clue. A clue. If they were a detainee, chances are it's going to be very difficult for them yeah. to have the medication. If they're on furlough and parole and they don't have the medication, that's something we can look at. For sure. Okay. So let's keep going here because we're running over time. <laughs> Lunch is here. What do you, I mean, we have a whole bunch of stuff we could talk about, but I want to make sure you hear what you want to hear. Well, why don't, instead of you folks going through page by page, is there anything from the committee members that you flip through that comes up at all for folks? Why don't we do it that way? Because I know we're running a little short on time. But is there anything that comes up if you look through the documents really quick? I think, well, you know, Alice, I think the, the, the health issue the, uh, and coverage is going to be uh, a topic that we'll want to dive into. So seeing the numbers is helpful at this point, uh -huh. uh, sort of introductory, but I, but I think we're going to have to come back to it in depth. And my internet is going in and out, so sometimes sometimes I lose you. So in terms of this is a, and you may not be able to speak uh, too deeply about this because there's a suit that's going to be filed. But the situation that occurred during the heat wave with some of our correctional staff and heat exhaustion, or. Um, can you explain a little bit more maybe what happened with the folks within the facility, the building themselves, or were they out in the rec yard? Um, how many officers? And then also talk about where we are in the process that you're aware of, you're not in the driver's seat, about um, installing air conditioning within our facilities and the cost of that for the system. Our so sure, I can certainly not speak to that. I know there was a report that there were four correctional officers that suffered from, from um, related illness. We're aware of two. We're only aware of, of two individuals. One of those, one of the individuals that was reported was um, a, a separate medical issue, not, not heat related. Part of the issue in the Springfield facility without the, the air conditioning that, that happened is we're under construction down there, the door control, um, and there's a lot of elect electronic upgrades happening which then interfered with the electricity and the power supply to the air conditioning unit and the infirmary so that was down for a short amount of time because uh, historically the, the infirmary is an air conditioned space within that facility um, the administrative areas are air conditioned uh, the infirmary is air conditioned the living units are not air conditioned um, so working closely with bgs we get that that fixed in the infirmary, I think it was the following day or, or that night. Um, but the, the, the truth of the matter is the, the facilities are hot. They are, they're cinder block and concrete and, and steel and, and they're, they're hot buildings uh, with, with very minimal um, ventilation. The superintendents of each of those facilities, the four that, that do, do not have um, total coverage of air conditioning, they're purchasing fans, they're purchasing um, cooling vests. We, we started this discussion uh, during COVID when, when Commissioner Baker was on board. We bought the cooling vests, we invested in, in lighter uniforms for staff. Um, we replaced all the uniforms that our, that our staff had that were heavy and heavy cotton and bulky. So they're, they're all wearing a much lighter, more breathable um, uniform now. Um, staff are allowed to, we purchased polo shirts that are, that are more breathable athletic fabric for our staff, so they have that. Um, there are air conditioned areas that they can go to and break rooms and so forth. Um, we 
St. Albans, they, they purchased a misting station. I know one facility purchased a slushy machine, so we're getting a, a nice ice cold slushies for the staff. Uh, so, th you know, we're, we're trying to be as creative as we can until we get the, the project off the ground with, with installing air conditioning throughout all of our facilities. Uh, right now, Marble Valley and Chipper are the only ones that have full, full air conditioning throughout. So the Capitol bill, we did put in $5 million <coughs> that the bulk of it is Springfield, but also some of that could be used for other spots within some of the other facilities like break rooms or visiting rooms for uh, inmates and their families. So some of the antennas like, like those mini split units in, in the visiting room that, that currently doesn't have it. Part of the challenge there though is concrete and rebar trying to find an appropriate mounting solution for those for those units, but that, that is the intent is to increase some of that until the, uh, the larger project can be completed. And to air condition all of our facilities, the remaining facilities, I believe the number was around 20 million? I believe so, yeah. yeah. With Northwest being the most expensive by far, right. some structural work that would be done. But Chair, as you know, Southern, where we're hoping to start this work, Tom mentioned, uh, is our newest facility. Um, and it is not fully air conditioned. Uh, and I think that goes to show that the existing infrastructure that we have as a state is inadequate. Um, and that we are trying to reimagine a new future of our correctional facilities that really meet Vermont's values. And I think having air conditioning is a key component of that. Anything else from members that are triggering? Folks got off easy so far. Anything else? So let's go first. It was a slide in the hospital coverage for field sites. I don't know if you want to touch on that because that's. Why don't you quickly do that? Yep. I just wanted on the, uh, Madam Chair, in the on the heat wave, or sorry, heat <clears throat> question as we face more heat waves. I've been hearing FEMA and the federal government are trying to make heat waves is one where you have to be much more proactive in the funding that you provide rather than reactive. Um, have you been talking to the federal delegation about um, assistance in the climate transition with AC from the federal level? We have not. No, no didn't know that was an option, frankly. Might so well. we can do that. Yeah. Because it's a heavy lift just to do it on the state level. And I think time-wise, like, when I read Digger this morning, and I don't know if this date was accurate or not, but for the air conditioning unit in Springfield, to be up and running won't be until 2027. I think we're 20, yeah. That, we're hoping 26, 27, it's, it's a ways out. That's two sure. years out. Yeah. I mean, that, it's three summers. I mean, it just doesn't seem should take that long. But I know you're going to have to probably move population, shift out the units, that type of thing. But the time frame seems pretty long. Is there, is there, has there been any assessment of the need? I mean, obviously you're talking about the need because it's very hot in these buildings. But have you looked at the or work with Efficiency Vermont or uh, utilities or others around heat pumps um, and options that might begin the cooling process. Yes, that's Co and cost analysis. That that is some of the work we we have done, Senator, in working with BGS. I mean, this really falls on BGS more than it does us, but but those yeah. conversations are ongoing with, with them around like the heat pumps and so forth on, on how we can get into some of the the smaller areas in our facilities. Okay, thank you. Yes, it, it, this is a concern. I think, well, this is something probably that has to be taken up. So why don't you go into the hospital coverage here real quick? So hospital coverage, as you know, has been a, a hot topic, starting with COVID and staffing challenges and, and moving people into hospitals and, and having to provide that coverage with the staffing challenges that we face. We had 314 emergency room visits so far in 2024, to put into perspective the challenges that we're facing with, with our aging population and, and increasingly sicker population. 
Um, 2023, we had 532 ER visits, so we're on track to, to exceed what we had for, for emergency room visits last year. Um, you'll see on this slide where, where we're covering the, uh, the hospital coverage. We did some, um, some research and, and looked at how we could potentially cover these, these slots better. We created our central operations team which is a team of nine individuals currently that their primary role is only hospital coverage. Specially trained team throughout the state to deploy when needed to cover, to cover the hospital, hospitalizations of, um, of our incarcerated population. You'll see in this, this pie chart where we've covered, um, this is November of 23 through May of 24, uh, where we covered 8,688 hours of hospital coverage um, for our incarcerated population. Uh, the majority of that, those hours being covered by um, the central operations team. Part of the challenge with this is we don't know when those people will be coming out, right? So it's not like we can plan to say we need six people on shift for this. It could be this week we have nobody going to the hospital, Next week, it could be seven people going to the hospital, and then that's where we run into that, those challenges of, of that coverage, and, and still having to, to lean on the field for, for the coverage. You'll see that uh, probation and parole officers covered about 11% of those hours. Um, volunteers and, and facility staff covered a, a combined 13% of the hours. Um, so the, the hospital team is, is doing its job. It's reducing that, that burden on the, on the probation and parole staff. Um, in order to further alleviate that burden, we've added two more positions. We're currently recruiting for those positions now. Last I heard, we had about 30 applicants from across the department that had applied for those two positions. So those interviews will be um, happening within the next week or so. So this hospital coverage is really, it's also more than just ED trips, correct? I mean, yeah. these are for folks as well that are admitted and might be there for a week or two weeks. And if they're admitted and they have to be there for a week, do you need two correctional folks on staff or just one and or not? Historically, we, we try to stick with one person. And, and it's a lot of it is dependent on the risk of the individual, the charges, a detainee that's on for murder that has a risk of flight, we'll probably have two people on there. Somebody that is non-ambulatory and we're, we're comfortable with, with one person where that's, that's fine as well. So we, it's a case-by-case -case basis on how we provide the coverage depending on the risk of the individual. So, so is that coverage 24-7 <coughs> they're admitted and it would be right outside their room? or In their room. In their room. Yes. So how does that work? 24 hours a day, one person. What? Two, two 12 hour shifts. Two 12 hour shifts. So one person covers for the 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then another person covers. Oh, so covers. two people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. These are things that we don't think about in <coughs> corrections, but even when someone is transported for a medical appointment, are you having one officer or two for that transport? It depends on their custody level. Minimum custody requires only one person. Medium custody and above requires two people. Federal transports <coughs> require two staff who have to, who are armed um, per federal regulations. So these are the nuances that we don't even think about that corrections has to deal with. Anything else before we move on to one other item that's not connected with corrections but connected to us as a committee? Get this taken care of. Just got a quick question. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, uh, those individuals who are in state's custody, are they able to be restrained using software transfer? Just no restraints whatsoever while they're in the hospital. They're, they're restrained in the hospital. Um, they'll require, obviously, if they're going into an MRI or surgery, we'll often remove the, uh, the hardware. But um, again, it's, it's how ambulatory they are and what their behavior is like. <coughs> But usually it's it's a one one restraint to the, the bed post and an ankle. Harry? Hi, I don't know if this question has to do with it. Was, was it um, I don't know if this question has to do with population or uh, what, but I'll launch it. It came from 
a Vermont resident. Uh, last year, several assaults occurred in one of our cities. Last week, the perpetrator was sentenced to serve 30 days of a nine-month sentence. Yet, the guilty party was spotted back out on the streets that same day on parole. The question is, are we paroling people because we don't have enough space to house them in prison for 30 days, or why else would someone be let back out? So, I, I think, to answer it accurately, I would need a lot more information on the case and the, the specifics, but, um, but the parole board has the authority to, to parole at, at their discretion, um, not our discretion. So that, that decision to parole somebody would be on the parole board, not corrections. Um, there could be a credit for time served, which is a zero min sentence, and they're automatically eligible for release. Um, so there, there could be some different nuances on, on why that, that happened. Because this is credit for time served, but they're a detainee, and they could be there for a month or two months or two years. Right. That gets calculated that they've already got credit for time served. So say they've been there for two years, they finally get sentenced to five years. They've already served two years, so they'd have three years. So in that particular situation, the person could have been a detainee for 60 days. And then the person was sent there to be incarcerated for a particular amount of time. Thank you. So that's another nuance for corrections. Yeah, I would love to. Um, Amina Tebbles on the Zoom call. She's our new executive director of health, wellness, and engagement. So you'll see her um, whenever we call in WellPath or um, talk about health at all in our system. She's working really closely with us on a lot of community engagement projects, the Turning Point Center, the 1115 waiver, um, in partnership with DIVA and the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative and a plethora of other things. So I might have her actually introduce herself, if you don't mind, because she'll be in this building pretty frequently. Great. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, really excited to join the DOC team and looking forward to meeting all of you uh, in person sometime soon. And how do you pronounce your first name? Viva. Viva? Viva. Viva. <laughs> so we will be in contact because I know we're going to be talking later on this afternoon about what um, items we want to have covered and I know health care and WellPath and Diva and Medicaid coverage and the 1115 waiver and all of that um, we're very interested in and so that would be either in August and September for us just to give you a heads up. Else. Thank, you. Thank you. So before we break for lunch, because I don't want to lose Janine, I don't want to lose Keisha, we, or Trevor, uh, Martin had to scoot out for something, he will be back. Um, we had a conversation this morning, um, Janine, prior to you coming on board about um, how we move forward as a committee in terms of leadership for the committee. In DOC, we're done. We can get off the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, I'd just like to get this done before we break the lunch for that. Um, and I don't know, Jenny, if you want to share what your thoughts were. You and I had a conversation. Yeah, let, yes, I'd be, I'd be glad to do that. And I think this is a, obviously, it's a committee decision. However, the with the loss of Senator Sears, and that, that's pretty significant. We all know that, and we all are going, we're missing him already, especially in this environment. Uh, he is chair of the committee. It was Senate, Senate turn for him to be chair, and Alice has been so really terrific and gracious in taking over the committee when Dick hasn't been available, and now when he is no longer here with us. My thinking was to continue as we are and have Alice continue to run the meetings for, uh, as vice chair without, um, without electing a new uh, chair. I, I think um, it, for me, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I am probably the next Senator um, on the list just in terms of longevity. That doesn't mean um, that, that I'd become 
chair and I'm certain I'm certainly not asking to have that happen what I'm asking for is for us to allow for Alice to continue as vice chair and coordinate and work with us on uh, our agendas and and then continue until um, after the November election and after uh, new appointments are made. I did raise this issue with the pro tem and he was perfectly fine with it. And Alice, I don't know if you had a chance to talk with Jill or not, oh, okay. uh, but, but it is a, it is a committee decision. It's just my suggestion. So other, th I know one thing that was talked about this morning was Topper was saying about an interim chair and you're saying just keep it the way it is and just have the vice chair continue in the vice chair position and do the work. Either way it works, it doesn't matter. Well, yeah, no, and and honestly, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you if, there, if there's a need uh, that we can work together on that. And I think others are, I think we all, we, have, we usually work pretty collaboratively on this committee and ha have, an, have interests, similar interests. So I'm fine going forward, Allison, uh, mm -hmm. giving you the heavy lift. Yeah. <clears throat> Harry? That, that's, and that's up to you. I mean, then that's right. up to the folks on the committee. Right. Thank you. Um, my concern would be having someone appointed to fill that other Senate slot. Yeah. for the remainder of this year and i believe there are some senators with judiciary experience on well, the senate committee you need someone from a probes because bob is here for senate judiciary yeah i believe there are senators on a probes who could be appointed have you spoken to phil about filling that yes i have and um i think he was very happy to have us go forward um with your um leadership and that he is looking to i think fill the slot and i can't tell you when or who or what but that will happen yeah that slot needs to be filled okay, thank you for and, sure and secondly i would like to um <clears throat> maybe appoint you interim chair and then appoint an interim vice chair because i think every chair needs advice just in case need a bus. so i <laughs> So, I, so if we're, we were going to yeah. consider you as interim chair, I'd like to have us consider an interim vice chair, and I would just love to have Jimmy fill that role. But that's just me. So that's my input. Well, so, so Irene, uh, thank you for that. I mean, that's, that's something we can do, um, rem remembering that right now, this, this session, this term, this year, it's the Senate's role to be chair. So. Sure. That, so, yeah, so I'm, this would be an exception. I, I don't know for, what I don't know what law we're violating. Ben, maybe you can help us. Are we violating what rules are we violating if we did it that way? Well, so there is the statute that creates the committee in Title II, Chapter uh, Twenty Three, um, but it doesn't account for an absence or vacancy from the chair position or the committee in general. There is a mandate to create rules of procedure. Which we haven't done. Um, so you could make the argument that this is a, a new procedure that's being adopted. Um, but there's nothing that really covers this specific <clears throat> scenario. So I guess what's before us, I think there's agreement that I would continue being leadership of the group. The question is, do I stay as vice chair and we have the slot for chairs empty. We keep it empty. I continue for the remainder of this biennium with an understanding that I'd reach out to Ginny to help uh, with agendas and help uh, with the committee. That's one plea, one avenue. The other avenue is what Irene put on the table that we actually have an interim situation where you have an interim chair and an interim vice chair. You see the difference? So, if I could. <laughs> yeah, Keisha? Yeah, I mean, if I could just add that I think this is, in my mind over the years, this has been one of the more formal, um, you know, committees that functions outside of our regular session. And 
it's probably a good thing to formalize our approach to whatever we do. Um, you know, there's just, I think we're, we've hit a phase in the legislature where we're seeing more turnover more regularly for whatever reason. And um, it would just be good to ha to formalize whatever approach we put in place. And I would tend to agree that I'd rather just call you Madam Chair for the next several meetings, you know, <laughs> instead of interim acting vice chair. Um, and, and I think it is good to have a, a vice chair from the Senate. Um, and, and Ginny, I know you often get busy with LCAR, like, of course, you'd be great. You know, I just also thought it's, if, if Senator Norris, as the member from judiciary, wanted to just fill that role, that's a thought too, because it was coming up about different parties, which I don't think has been a, I mean, given that it was Senator Sears and Representative Emmons, that's, I don't think that was a, a spoken rule of any kind, but you know, it was just sort of giving you the option to not have to take on another out of session role if you, if you don't want one. Um, but I do think whatever we do, we should just formalize it and recognize that it's an incredibly special case in terms of reversing the Senate and House role. Um, but that maybe we should formalize the idea that the vice chair, should there be some kind of vacancy due to a health emergency or um, you know, a loss, the vice chair does take over for the remainder of that biennium. Um, and that is okay to flip the balance that way. So I li listen, I think that is the right way to look at it, where this is an interim step. The vice chair has been offering continuity and providing support for Dick while he was uh, unable to be at meetings and to put, put uh, to work with him and put agendas together. And it's not, it, it could be that um, appointments are made or an appointment is made and then we, we come back and we have the discussion about uh, election of a chair again. But right now we don't have a whole committee. So I do think it has nothing to Oops, you cut out. You cut out, Jenny. Maybe take yourself off a video. I don't know if you can hear us. She said it was coming in and out. I know, I know. So I'm hearing agreement about an interim chair. That's what I'm hearing, I think. And we do have a quorum to make that decision. I don't right. think we need to wait for every last person to get back on or in. Right. Or whatever, right? Quorum is six. Mm -hmm. Quorum is six people. Yeah. So. Can they vote being on Zoom? <sighs> or senators? <sighs> yes. Uh, senators can vote on Zoom. No. no. There has to be, there no. has to be a, there has to be a rule. We have to make a law. We have to make a rule. No. I thought it was we get. This is dictated by Senate and House rules. Yeah. Yeah. We lost Jenny. And the, I thought the Senate rule was that we have two meetings remote where we can vote out of session. And then we have to be there in person to vote. And I don't remember what the House was. Well, yeah. Give me a second to double check. I want to eat lunch. The house was, uh, there, there was a couple of meetings. We could was it two? I don't remember. <clears throat> but joint meetings? Was it? it was joint resolution five, I believe. Ginny's back. I'm hey, here. You... Can you hear me? Yes. You can now. Yeah, go ahead. Finish um, what you were saying. My, my internet is going nuts. Um, what? Where did I leave off? I don't remember. <laughs> I will just say this. <laughs> this is an unusual time. This has nothing to do with whether or not I would like to do the work. This has to do with providing continuity and the work that Alice was doing with Dick and Alice's um, leadership as vice chair and to allow for that to continue. Should there be another appointment from the Senate, we can come back and revisit this. But I think right now it makes sense to keep going. Uh, I'm happy to help as as Bob and Irene and Trevor and Keisha and and um, uh, others are willing to help. And Topper, I know you're you're, you're there <laughs> as well. So I think everyone's everyone's you know we've all worked together very well, and obviously we've got Ben helping us as well. So. 
I just think it makes sense to keep going. We've got, a, I have a long list of things that I'm interested in. And I think that you guys probably do too. But I think if we keep it, keep it as simple as possible um, mm -hmm. and allow for Alice to continue as, uh, as in her vice chair role uh, uh, and the rest of us can pitch in. And right. I, so, I don't know, Bob, I don't know what you're thinking or Topper. Or you're... So, so what, what you're talking about is continuing as a vice chair and not as an interim chair. Is that correct? I am. I think it, it's less complicated uh, in that way. We're not changing the um, sequence of uh, chairmanship for the committee, which is this year it's um, Senate. Yeah. That's okay. all. So under the extenuating circumstances that we're in, um, if, if a motion of any kind is in order, I'd like to make it right now. And you want a direction of yeah. what the motion would be? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I look for direction. Um, but so I just, I need some more time to find the resolution okay. to make sure that Maybe we can have lunch. So my, my suggestion is that maybe save this for that discussion portion at the end and just do it right at the outset. Okay. Um, and then I can, during lunch hour, I'll just double check the- So you tell us how we can do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But this is for voting. For voting on- for Zoom. On this, yeah, and Zoom okay. remotely, so. Okay. This could be different for House members and Senate. Yeah, so I just want to double check. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh. So, and, uh, let's- uh, Bob, do you have any thoughts? I, I don't want to, I, I, I just, I bring the idea, and Alice and I talked about it, but I think it is a committee decision. Yeah. I don't have any thoughts on one way or the other. I mean, I can tell you that I'm hungry. <laughs> but I think given, given the time that we get to review this afternoon, that's fine. I would, I would yield to my senior ranking uh, senators on screen as to which direction I'd like to go, and I'm more happy to uh, fulfill any role that you you choose whether just remain the way that it is or, or whatever. I, I don't have any problem with it either way. Senator Lyons. Hi, Rain. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do we have a clerk? I only see a vice chair designated on here. And again, it's really important to me that we have two people to whom to direct the leadership questions on a committee like this, on Senate One House, just because we want somebody who's on bat. And who's on deck, always, just, just as a matter of practice. So I don't care what we call them, but I want someone, whether it's Ginny or someone else, who steps up from the Senate to be that person that has Alice's back. And I, I think Jen said that she would be it. It would be okay to do that, right? I just want to formalize yeah. the title yeah. more of yes. place where yeah. she said that she was okay with that. Okay. So let's, let's bring, let's come back to this conversation after Ben's had a chance to look at the joint, the resolutions that were passed to see if folks that are on Zoom can vote or not. So that would be House and Senate, because we have a House member as well. So cafeteria is not open. I think we could do lunch in half an hour and get back here a little bit around. We welcome back, folks. This is Joint Justice Oversight Committee. It is July 2nd. We are continuing our meeting this afternoon, and we're going to be starting with Judge Zoni to give us some um, updates on the court systems. Um, <clears throat> I know that there's, yes, okay. way down there. Um, I know that there's initiatives that were put together during this past legislative session, so I can lean on Representative Martin Milan for some of that, because it did come out of Judiciary Committees as well as um, some of mm -hmm. Norris. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Judge, thank you. and um, it's all yours. Welcome. So thank you. So good afternoon, everyone, uh, those present and those uh, who are appearing via Zoom today. Uh, for the record, Tom Zone, Chief Superior Judge. I thought I would just speak with you for a few minutes about some of the initiatives that have been going on. And uh, during the legislative session, the legislature uh, enacts bills uh, with the governor, and then it comes to the court, and we often wonder what's happening after that. So I thought it would be helpful to just let you know that with respect to the legislation that's been enacted, uh, there were some that became effective upon passage earlier in the session. 
and other statutes uh, were yesterday. July 1st is that magic day for most. After the court is notified, after the judiciary is notified that a bill has been passed, what we do is we come up with summaries. And we have a summary that is provided not only to internally, the staffing side, but also the judges. We also had judicial college in early June, and as far as the bills that were enacted as of June, uh, on or before June 13th, because I, I did a training on this on the 14th, but on the 13th, we uh, in the, told the judges what the new bills were and uh, gave them summaries and went over the different bills that were going on. Of significance, uh, there are some bills that had uh, some changes on July 1st, and I would note H27, which was the coercive and control bill that added coercion and control as uh, a basis for getting an abuse, a relief from abuse petition. And so that took, that started yesterday. Uh, there have been trainings done not only to put the judges on notice of this new law, uh, but also for staff, uh, to have staff understand the new law. And uh, training has been done with the after hours workers. In addition, the forms were changed. And so the forms were put together and uh, we had them effective as of July 1st. And so uh, we are moving ahead with that uh, aspect of the H-27. And we also did, I would note, a training at Judicial College with judges that uh, touched on coercion and control. So it's something that we have, in response to the legislature moving forward on that, uh, addressed. In addition, uh, it's not just the H-27 changes for form, but any other form changes that may have been necessitated have also been implemented. We're also, uh, the legislature and the governor agreed that we should have some new judges and staff positions. The governor's office has sent over the request to the judicial nominating board for the vacancies to be posted so that we can move forward with that. Uh, we get some work out of that, uh, Senator Norris. Uh, and also the judiciary is moving forward to try to advertise and fill the other positions. We, uh, when we talk about uh, positions, uh, staffing is something that can always be uh, challenging, not only when we get new positions uh, is that helpful, but it also fills positions where people are retiring. So we've lost two of our uh, court clerks to retirement, uh, long-standing ones, and so uh, up in your neck of the woods, Senator uh, Gay Paquette, uh, she retired, and Chris Brock <coughs> and Chitton did retire, and so steps are being taken to fill those very important positions. The judiciary used to have and is now reinstating what's called a day in Montpelier for new employees. Mm -hmm. And what that means is when someone comes in, we want them to realize you're not just a judicial assistant or staff member in X court in X county, but you're part of a very important organization, separate branch of government, the judiciary. And we want people to understand the importance of that. And so the idea was to have uh, staff members come in to the uh, Supreme Court uh, early on and get to see what's going on there to recognize that, again, we're all in this together. It also establishes relationships between employees who might not have met if one's from the north part and one's from the south. So it's, it's something that we understand has been effective, and uh, Terry Corsones, the court administrator, and Lori Canty, uh, the director of trial court operations, have been uh, wanting to move forward with that to re-implement that. We also have been, uh, with the, the way our staff was structured, we had a number of limited service positions that ended on June 30th, this weekend. And so what has happened is, for instance, we had uh, operations assistants who would work on WebEx. So when there was a WebEx hearing, what the individuals would do is their, their role was to serve as the producer, if you will. Make sure it comes up on the screen, make sure people were let in, things like that. With those positions being gone, what we now have done is the judicial assistants have been trained on how to support WebEx. And so that's a role that judicial assistants are undertaking. Good news comes, though, uh, in the form of the fact that the individuals who were the operations assistants, all but one, have transitioned into full-time uh, employment with the judiciary, not uh, limited service positions. So we have been able to take the knowledge which they have gained over the years and keep that in the judiciary as they move forward. We also have, <coughs> you may have heard something about technology in the judiciary, uh, the network. The network migration has taken place. It was successful, uh, moving ahead. Uh, are there times where 
you go, wait a minute, I don't understand this. Yes, and we have our tech people who work with us to make sure that things are moving smoothly in the right direction. There has been a upgrade to what was once called Odyssey. The name now is G uh, Justice Enterprise. They changed the name, I believe. And so we have also had an upgrade to that. And we're moving ahead with technological changes to make sure that we get it all done right. Uh, included within that is the implementation of a digital evidence management system. What that simply means is that uh, when you had, in the old days, if you had a, an exhibit that you wanted to introduce, you'd, you'd walk into court, you'd have a binder with it, you'd hand it, and you'd say, here's exhibit A, can you look at this? Now, there are requirements to file things electronically uh, ahead of the hearings uh, in accordance with uh, specific standing orders. And if someone can't do that, there's also the flexibility to allow them to do it differently. Uh, if something's not, if there's something not working, or someone doesn't have the technological ability to do that uh, as a self-represented litigant, for instance, we work with them to make sure that justice does allow them to have the exhibits admitted. But we do have the procedures down where there is a requirement that you do file it ahead of time, except for certain limited uh, areas where uh, there may be exceptions. We've also successfully migrated all arrest warrants to a digital platform. What it used to be was arrest warrants would be sent to uh, the county, uh, to a holding station for each county, and if an officer wanted to find out whether there was an active arrest warrant, he or she would have to contact that holding station and basically uh, cut to see what's going on. And my understanding is that in some of the stations it was literally files, pieces of paper and files. And that's now changed. We now have the Vermont Order and Warrant System, which is digital <coughs> statewide. And I am advised that all law enforcement have access to it. Uh, that is also taking place with regard to county protection, order, uh, protection orders for each county. That would include relief from abuse, stalking, and extreme risk protection orders, which were also paper in certain areas. And that migration is ongoing and is expected to be completed by September in which case we'll have all the orders accessible by law enforcement, and that will uh, certainly be uh, something that is much easier to do than calling and asking to have something faxed to you or emailed to you. Buildings. Yeah, just a quick question. So going back to the restraining orders, yep. <clears throat> what about the after hours restraining orders as far as that? <coughs> is 24 by 7? No, who's entering that? I'm just curious. Answering it? No. If someone is issued or, or given an after hours temporary restraining order, how does it show up in the database? It will show up under our system uh, once it's, it's been issued and entered. That's my understanding. So the person who's entering it <coughs> is going to enter it themselves? The person issuing the There is a process by which orders are put into vows, and so the after hours staff would make sure that things are taken care of with the, the clerks to, to do that. Good, good. Thank you. As far as buildings go, <clears throat> well, Windsor County. Well, you're actually right in the middle, too. Windsor and Wyndham. We have two construction projects going on. The project in Wyndham County is going to be, I understand it, roofs, or a roof, windows, things like that. The plan is to continue to have court operate in the state building on Putney Road while the construction is ongoing. Will there be times we have to maybe scale back a little bit or have disruptions, sure, we understand that's going to happen, but we're going to be able to stay in that building and continue to work and uh, try to facilitate uh, and maximize our ability to use that building while it's going on. The Windsor project that's happening is a little bit different. Uh, for those of you who know, in White River Junction, there is a courthouse downtown, and that is the civil, and, I'm sorry, that is the family and criminal divisions. That building is going to be shut down. It's not been finalized as far as a date. It built, that building also has within it the Judicial Bureau for uh, the traffic tickets and fish and wildlife uh, minor <coughs> issues and some municipal complaints. Uh, right across the street is a building that just happened next to the railroad uh, is a building that's one of the newer buildings in town uh, that had an opening and there was a vacancy. And so the Judicial Bureau and some staff from the probate court in Windsor, in Woodstock, are gonna be moving into that building. And then we're going to have the Woodstock building, which is the civil building, 
That's going to be used basically as the in-person trial building. We have hearings on the second floor. You can have trials there with jurors. And on the first floor, there is the probate courtroom, which can also be used for non-jury work. We are looking at attempting to utilize the county building, which is what we did last time. There was a construction project on the civil building. Uh, the county building is the one in Woodstock that is the old jail. And so there is space there that we can also utilize for staff and for uh, hearings if possible. We also right now are waiting on in, this, in the civil building. When they built that and redid it, they did not put a holding cell in. And so we're working on having it retrofit with a holding cell to be able to uh, do incarcerated individuals there. So there's a lot of moving parts. It's going to take quite a bit of scheduling. Uh, we're not we're going to have a, a certain hearings are going to be remote hearings going forward, but there are ones that obviously cannot be remote. And so those are the ones that we're going to make sure are taking place in the uh, Windsor Civil Building there in Woodstock. So, Judge, I have a question about the holding sure. cell. Is that, <clears throat> is that request coming from the judiciary for the holding cell? Yes. And is that a last minute thing that kind of came up, or has that always been no. in the plans? Uh, when we were notified that, we, when we came up with the idea that we we're going to have to move, and we were looking at different locations, one of the things that we talked about was the necessity of a holding cell. When we were looking at the potential for using the civil building, we reached out, and I, I actually personally reached out and spoke to former assistant judge Jack Anderson, who was the one who had done the building. He explained that when they did the building, they did not put the holding cell in a certain location, but he did tell me that we did actually put in plywood behind the walls and did the door frame so that there was a room that was in some ways able to be used so you didn't have to recreate the wheel. And so uh, we have always talked about that as being a requirement because we would not be able to have uh, criminal cases there with individuals in custody without it. The sheriff, had, sheriff Palmer has been very helpful as far as working with us to try to come up with solutions, not just for that type of issue in the building, but what happens when we have several individuals at once who are going to be there, and the sheriff is working with us to try to make sure that we're able to deal with that. So when, when will the holding cell be up? operational, do you think? Because BGS have, would be involved in that. That is right? correct. Uh, we had a meeting last week, and there, at that time, they still do not have the permit, I believe, and we don't know the date, because that's what's holding us up to know about when we can start there. Right, because there's been some confusion <clears throat> back home in terms of where arraignments are going to happen, and it was scheduled up in the Woodstock court at certain times. Now it's Move back at, down to the at one point there was talk about having things moving out on the beginning of June. Mm -hmm. uh, I will tell you my position was that we should not be moving until the absolute last moment because the disruption from White River is, is going to not allow us to be operating at 100% in terms of what we can accomplish in the building we have now in White River. And so uh, Ann Damone, who is the clerk for both Wyndham and Windsor, she's got two construction projects she's dealing with. I know that Ann has been working on that very topic. And uh, the question came up just last week about where are people going to be cited because we're citing out six weeks uh, for hearings. And so I know she's been in touch with law enforcement and we have other meetings coming up, should be next week with BGS to try to get uh, more specific dates. What is the date that we're going to have the holding cell when we can actually start using things there? Okay. Thank you. So, we also had, you may have heard over the past uh, couple years of the session, there was something called a backlog. <laughs> and now we're all incarcerated. <laughs> I, I, thought it, I thought it might be helpful <laughs> to just give some idea on. Uh, we, we have a clearance rate. A clearance rate is how many cases are coming in, how many cases are going out. And with respect to a clearance rate, when you have a backlog, you're never going to get rid of your black backlog if you don't have a clearance rate above 100. And so we have goals for what we're trying to accomplish. And I thought it would be helpful if I gave you the 13-month average clearance rate. And I can give specific counties, too, if you'd like. But for criminal in the state, our clearance rate has been 110%. For civil, it's 119%. 
family domestic 102, family juvenile 119, probate 114, environmental 129, and judicial bureau 104%. And so for the past year, for 13 months, we have been making uh, inroads and uh, reducing the backlog. We have some counties that, uh, for instance, in the criminal clearance rates, our highest county this past, in, as of June 28th, we had uh, was 136%, we had 124%, uh, and it varies. Uh, some months you get a really high number, some months it's a low number. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, reasons for that. But in terms of the rates, we are, are happy to say that we're over 100%, and the plan is when we have the new judges, we're going to continue to get those numbers higher. We have uh, taken strategies that we think have benefited us. We've tried to maximize the use of remote hearings. Uh, the stresses that are on the system, you, I, I know, heard from DOC today. There's significant issues that we face. Uh, DOC faces issues with respect to staffing and the ability to monitor and uh, be there to run, if you will, the remote hearings from the jail. Uh, but we also, on the other hand, have the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. The sheriffs don't have enough individuals to do transports. And so DOC has its policy on when it's going to allow remote hearings. The sheriffs have their policies, and the two aren't matching up quite as well as we would like. And so we have an inability to bring everyone to court due to transports and an inability to do all the hearings remotely due to certain constitutional or rule limitations, but also the fact that the Department of Corrections is saying, well, we don't have the staff to be able to allow you to do all these other hearings remotely. And so they have put out a standard operating procedure that says these are the limited hearings that you can do that will facilitate remotely and it wouldn't include a number of civil and other matters, and so we're, we're working on trying to address that. Uh, they have been, I would say, to the Department of Corrections, they have been very responsive when we've had concerns. Uh, the commissioner and uh, others in the department will talk to us about it. They're under difficult circumstances, and so I, I think that, uh, we just had a circumstance last week where I know that uh, the department worked hard to make something happen that might not have necessarily happened otherwise. And so we really appreciate the efforts they're making, but all you know, the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs, the DOC and the court, we all are trying to get the same goal, but it's difficult when uh, we're having trouble getting people to court. Are you finding, or do you, is there um, for DOC and, and the situations of trying to get someone um, <clears throat> to do it electronically, is there uh, a facility or a couple facilities that's more problematic than others that you're finding, or is it pretty even across the board? I think everyone's working hard. Uh, for instance, uh, Terry Corsones and I went at the meeting we had down at Southern States, mm -hmm. and uh, chair, uh, Vice Chair, I was listening this morning, <laughs> Vice Chair Evans was at that meeting, and uh, Terry and I had an opportunity to go out and see the facility, to visit with the men and women who were actually working there at the remote hearings. And they were great. They're working hard, they were engaged, they were interested, but they've got a lot of things on their plate. And so when we have difficulties, I think the difficulties are really more a function of just uh, the practical aspects of trying to get more staff and having staff do a number of things. DOC has roles of programming. They have roles of uh, reintegration they have to be working on. So they can't just be there working on the remote hearings for us all day. Uh, the attorneys uh, from the Defender General side of the equation, they're, st they're stretched. We have uh, Matt Valerio, the Defender General, has done a great job of getting attorneys to be able to take cases and uh, some of those attorneys are in different counties, and so their ability to work remotely and interact with their clients is important. And so it, there's a lot of, of these different parts moving, and it's, uh, I, frankly, it's impressive to see everyone working hard, and it can get frustrating because we're not all getting what we think we need to be, where we need to be, but that's, it's just a function of where we are, and we have to figure out how do we make things work as best as possible under the current circumstances that we have. It's our hope that when additional positions are 
going forward with DOC, uh, when the sheriffs start uh, getting more individuals hired, that the security transports, uh, DOC, that we're all able to get working at a level that's higher than where we are now. So, any questions you have? Well, I've got a question. This morning we went through some items with DOC as an update. <clears throat> and one thing that um, has really stood out was the number of detainees that they're uh, seeing. The number has now risen to about 540, 550. Um, <clears throat> we've never been that high. We've been more around 350. We've been bumping up to 420, 425, 450. But when you're reaching the detainee population at around 550, and we have a little bit more than 900 folks incarcerated, that's more than half of our incarcerated population are detainees. So when we ask DOC what, what's happening here, what are they saying? They're saying, well, we're picking up from the court back, backlog from COVID. Um, I just want to get your take on this. Is it, is it that we're catching up on the backlog from that? Uh, is it that um, there's more awareness about the public perception or public concern about public safety when people are arrested and then released, so now they're being held. Is it a reaction to the public concern? Is it that folks are coming in, they have a higher risk of flight, um, they're being held without bail, or they can't make bail? I mean, what's 550 is pretty high. So, as of this morning, there were 440 state detainees, and then there were 80 federal. So okay. that gets us into that higher number. So the 440 is the state number. Right. When I look back to this time in June of 2023, mm -hmm. that number was 394. For state? For state. This is state only. Uh, in June of 20, I'm sorry, let's go to, yeah, it was, let's go to July actually, because we're July 1st, that's my date. Uh, it, July 1st of 2023, it was 421. 2022, that same number was 368. 2021, 315. 2020, it was 304. And if you look in the different months during those prior years, we were down into the 200s. During the pandemic, <clears throat> it did drop down. And then it, it went back up again. I think it's difficult to say that the reason it's going up or down is attributable to one factor. There's any number of factors. Uh, there, those factors include uh, the, the backlog. That is certainly something that, that is a factor of pretrial detainees. If we're not having the cases go to trial or the cases resolved, then we're going to have those older cases sitting there waiting for trial, and as new cases come in, it's going to increase that number. And so it's important to keep in mind that one of the most important ways we have to deal with the detainee population is to keep scheduling trials and holding trials. We're not going to try our way out of it. Uh, statistically, if we said we're going to have a trial for every case, the system would not be able to do that. Over 99% of all cases settle uh, or are dismissed. So it's the vast majority of cases are, are resolved short of trial. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's, I just, I can't put my finger on it and say this is the reason. Uh, each of the factors that you talked about could certainly be playing a part and uh, how much each weighs on the scale of each particular case. It's something you really can't tell. Uh, I do note that uh, the 60-day the cases, where when someone has a 60-day case that they're held without bail, uh, our goal is to get those cases heard within 60 days. So they go right to the, to the front of the line. And that sometimes creates a little bit of, of the backlog, too. So another question, and this is coming from the work that my committee has done on home detention. And and now we have six people on home detention. It went up by two from what was there back in April. But our judges, um, because we've expanded the conditions of release 
through our pretrial, um, <clears throat> let's say, supervision program, because that hasn't really gotten started, but through the bill in general, we're trying to get um, more folks to be supervised in the community via either electronic monitoring or home detention. And what's, what's been the process of today, today to work with judges so that they be more amendable for home detention, possibly the electronic monitoring piece? I have, Where are we on this? Uh, I have visited with the judges, as I've said in your committee during the session, many times about the uh, home detention numbers. We've talked about the, the fact that I think it was very clear in the 2023 session uh, that uh, I think the phrase was use it or lose it. That if judges think it's important as a, an ability to have home detention, uh, why do we only have so few cases? And why are the numbers going down? So judges are aware that that is a potential. Uh, I think it really is a function of uh, judges looking at the particular cases that come before them. And when I talk to the judges about why are the numbers staying where they are, uh, one of the things that keeps coming back is that the, the, when you order that report and you're coming in for a hearing, the fact that someone does not get put on, pre on home detention doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't effective because many of those cases will resolve with a plea agreement or the parties come up with conditions of release. And so if DOC, let's say, is asked to do 30 reports, whatever the number was, I think, last year when I checked this, there was a time when DOC was asked to do a certain number of reports. And I think the natural tendency would be to think, well, DOC did 30 reports and we only have six people. But when we looked into it closer, what we found was that the majority of those people who uh, had put the reports in, their cases resolved or they were released on, uh, on conditions by agreement. And so they didn't need to go to home detention. And so if the test for whether home detention is effective is simply going to be the number of people on it, I would suggest that's not, we're, we're not capturing the entire benefit of it because it is something that when that is a potential mechanism for release, it does bring the parties together. Because what we know is oftentimes uh, when the state and the defense get together, <clears throat> They have the ability to resolve the matters. Mm -hmm. Questions? I got one. I got one. <clears throat> um, for several years now, I've been concerned about people being released um, who might have been incarcerated. They go to the hearing and then they're released. And they have certain prescription drugs that they need to take, but there's no provision for them to get them when they're released by the judge. Is anything, can anything at all be done about that? Or even hooked up with treatment programs as well, if it was a drug related? Well, the court does have the ability to uh, order that someone uh, in, get engaged in an assessment and uh, services that they may need. The question on that person connecting is really outside the ability of the court. The court can't say, well, we want you to go to this program and we're going to make the arrangements for you. We can identify the program and we can try to help, uh, but that's where the attorneys may come in. That's where community resources come in. Uh, the bill that went forward that has the uh, pretrial monitor, yeah. I'm sorry, the uh, pretrial uh, pre services yeah. you know, monitor that, that went through, uh, if that goes through, that's going to provide, because one of the key components of that, it wasn't just watching over someone, but it was assisting them in getting services and assistance that they may need. And so that's a mechanism that can assist uh, individuals with doing that. Uh, as far as individuals who, need, uh, who, who may have uh, prescription needs, I think it's fair to say that when a judge is made aware of someone's particular needs, he or she will go out of their way to try to say, okay, what can we do to help? Recognizing that our role is limited, but if, there, if I can make a decision or if I can facilitate someone making that call to do something, whether it's contacting DOC uh, yeah. from the bench and saying, can you contact DOC and find out what's going to happen with the transition of the medication, that their meds were in jail, how are they going to get this, what's going to happen, 
or just asking the individual, you take, you take medication, what's your plan when you leave? Do you have it set up? Where are you going to get it? And if they say, I have no plan, looking at the prosecutor and defense attorney and saying, okay, what are we going to do? Looking at DOC's representative and saying, how can we address this? Because we're in the people business. We're trying to help this individual get the medical uh, attention and correctional attention and treatment they need so that when they go out, they have the skills to succeed. That sounds good. In theory, in practices is going on. Uh, my understanding is that that is the practice that many judges implement, and I can tell you that the fact that you asked that question, there will be more judges, uh, as in all the judges, will be aware that this is something we really need to focus on. <laughs> I, I, meet I meet monthly with the judges, okay. and it's questions like that that are, that are the, that I, I would like to say to you, I have specifically talked to the judges about this question, and here is what, what happened. Uh, and I can't say that today, right. uh, but the next time we speak, after we have our meeting, I'll be able to say that. Good. Thank you. He's going to hold him to it, too. Who? You're going to hold him to it, Absolutely. Too. <laughs> Other questions? That's a big deal. Martin came on, on board here. Do you have anything? Uh, yeah, I have, I have a couple uh, questions as well. Nice to see you, Judge Zone. Good to see you. Um, so it's it's more about uh, getting well, a couple of things. First of all, the stats that you just mentioned as far as the clearance rate, uh, if you could provide those to our committee assistants so that we can put them on uh, the committee's website. Um, uh, and and I I know that you're that the court and you you're, you and Terry are very good at uh, providing those statistics uh, upon request. Uh, but I wonder if we could plan just generally that those are provided to uh, this committee uh, for each of its uh, scheduled meetings. Uh, and, and this is something I know we're going to be talking about a little bit later as far as what what this uh, the this committee should be doing uh, for the rest of the off session. Yeah, I will preview that I believe we should have somebody from the courts in for at least an update uh, each each time and, and look at where the stats are and look at how uh, the staffing is being filled. Um, so I would request though that it also include just the uh, time to disposition stats that you know we've we've uh, relied on in in the uh, House Judiciary Committee. Uh, so we can follow just the trend. I know that it's gonna take a little while to get everybody on board, but I think we should just uh, be on top of that. The other thing it has to do again with stats is, uh, so that was a request, not so much a question, uh, is uh, with respect to the detainees, which I, I guess this will also be more of a, a data request. Uh, I, I've seen the, the raw numbers and the high level numbers for detainees over the past couple of years, uh, but I think it would be much more helpful for us to understand where the, uh, what's driving this and how big of a concern it should be uh, if it's broken down. Uh, I know that I've seen the stats where every individual detainee is listed, uh, and that's actually somewhat helpful, but it would be good to have some summaries as well. But I think it's important for us to understand who is held on bail, who is held without bail. Uh, those who are held on bail, what the bail amount is. I know I've seen those reports already, uh, but a couple of things that we, I well, I guess they also has the underlying charges usually in this report that that we. That is, that is a report that DOC generates. If I yeah, want to copy yeah. that, I, I get that from DOC, and, and it has all the information you just indicated. Correct. Okay, so there's one further item. So I guess we can go to DOC for that to make sure we get that. Uh, it would be nice if they would do some of the summaries, uh, such as summarizing how many are held on bail without bail, et cetera. Anyway, but they also, I don't recall that that report has the duration of detention of each of those individuals plus the average, because I'm curious how much of this is somebody who's being held past 60 days, or is this this constant churn? And we happen to have a lot more people who are being held without bail or are committing crimes that they can be held on bail. They're only held for 30 days, but there's there's a lot of throughput. And, and I don't think one can gather that from that report very easily. And I think that would be very helpful. My concern is more so uh, those individuals being held for a long time uh, being detained, uh, as opposed to that raw number is of less concern to me 
uh, it, it's it's uh, why they're being contained detained uh, and for the duration. So I think that would be helpful. I do have actually the, my notes that I read from. I prepared a PowerPoint for myself to go with notes. So if that's okay, uh, and it had that last slide I went over with the clearance rates on it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you'd like, I can send that to Ms. Canella. Yeah, that you have was. That? Okay. So I just want clarity in terms of <clears throat> looking at the detainees and seeing, I have seen that list of underlying charges, how many are held with bail. That's all generated by DOC? Yes. And even the length of time, in terms of how long they've been detained, that's also by DOC. I believe DOC has that information, yes. Okay. Just so that we know where to go. And if, they, if DOC does not have it, I will look on our end and see about what we generate. But I'm pretty sure that's where I have seen that information from, is the DOC side. Because I know I, I see that information. Yeah, oops, I've seen it too. Right. And it is very enlightening to look at this um, because we may come at it with certain assumptions, and then when you look at it, it throws those assumptions out the window pretty, pretty quickly. Anything else, Martin? Yeah, I mean, the other thing, and this is uh, probably more of the later discussion, I think we need to have some uh, further look at really where the issues are with remote hearings. Uh, yeah how that's working but but i would also add to that just to um get it on judge zone's uh list there is that um i i've heard from uh, numerous individuals that the fact that that in some respects there can be too many remote hearings uh and there's a great benefit particularly i think in having the defense counsel and prosecutors at the courthouse because a lot of business can be done more expeditiously. Uh, I don't know how that works with not having the defendant there, but but I think that that's one aspect that should be looked into and whether, in fact, there should be some more requirements that prosecutors and defense counsel actually are there in person so that business can get done more expeditiously. Uh, that is very true that statistically it benefits us when we have the parties there because you can sometimes accomplish something in person you can't do it remotely. The difficulty that we run into is that the pressures, if you have an attorney, for instance, who has a contract from there in Burlington and they agree to take a contract in one of the southern counties, to get them to come down for a status conference to Windsor County is very difficult sometimes because they're not able to then address the Burlington cases that day. And so this is where I'll, I'll say it's more of an art than a science for the judges to be able to figure out, okay, do I need the person there, the attorney there and the client there? Is this one of those moments where they have to be there? Uh, and relying on the prosecutor and the defense attorney, uh, there are attorneys who will say, look, uh, judge, we should be in person. I think that'll give us a chance to resolve things. So the attorneys will self-select on that also. But uh, the difficulty we, we run into is if we're having attorneys and saying we need you in this county in person, we need you in that county in person, in this county in person, and the attorneys are viewing it as just a quick status conference. Uh, I think you're going to hear from, you could hear from Mr. Valerio. I suspect he would tell you that you have attorneys who would tell him we shouldn't have to drive there in person for some of these hearings. And if the choice is take this contract and drive all over the state. Uh, I might not take the contract. And so I'm aware some contracts might not have been renewed uh, coming up. And that, that type of overload is one of the factors that uh, I have been notified of. And so it's, it's a real balance trying to figure out how do we maximize in person and yet respect the idea that we can possibly also have a gain by having remote for some of these attorneys to, to be able to operate in multiple counties as they are doing. And, and I guess one, um, I certainly defer to the court as a separate branch and, and, and trust the judgment of the, ju of the judges in doing that. But it would be helpful if we had some sort of statistics on that as well. And I know that in last November's joint uh, rules, uh, the, leg uh, the uh, Judicial Rules Committee, uh, which I have the pleasure of serving on as well, uh, that there was a request when we were looking at rules for when a judge can decide that a hearing is remote or joint, 
uh, or, or uh, uh, both remote and in person, uh, that they were going to start getting us some idea of how that's working and how much, how many hearings are being held uh, uh, as uh, remote, as in person, and as uh, both together, which I can't remember what that's called. Hybrid. Hybrid. <laughs> hybrid. That was a very difficult word that I was having trouble. That's what we're having today, hybrid. Yeah, yeah, exa exactly. I think it's uh, my father's aphasia is catching uh, here in Virginia. In any event, <laughs> putting that aside, uh, I don't know if uh, Emily Weatherall was, she was the person who was there. And, and if there's just some follow up to see if there uh, is some sort of uh, uh, data that we can see how that's working, just so we can keep tabs. I appreciate uh, your time. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Martin. Anything? Any other questions? Um, yeah, a little, yeah, a little bit of a question. It's something I was going to bring up later on when we were talking about getting um, updates. But, Judge, um, thank you for being here. And I know uh, you're working really hard uh, with the Judiciary Commission on Mental Health and the Courts, and Martin and I have been involved in that. Um, are there updates that you can give us suggesting that the work that we're doing related to mental health is um, improving wait times or other aspects of uh, court process. I mean, at the, some point, get, get, a, get a full report. The, the changes that were implemented last year with uh, having the ability to use doctoral level psychologists, uh, the changes that were made at that time uh, have definitely shortened the times. And I believe uh, Department of Mental Health would be able to have information about that as far as specific times from when they get to the, report, the request for the competency evaluations until uh, the time they get that. So the, those times have shortened significantly, I believe. As far as the other changes, there have been a number of changes that were done this year uh, also, and I think we'll still have to wait and see. Uh, there were changes that talk about whether uh, individuals can testify remotely uh, for the examining physician. Uh, there was changes to make clear the burden and that someone is presumed competent and the burden is on them to establish incompetence by preponderance of the evidence. Those were the types of changes that I think over time we'll see how it <coughs> moves forward. The changes this year with respect to individuals with uh, intellectual disabilities will be significant because uh, as I testified during the legislative session, uh, it was helpful to have a, a rewrite of those statutes to address the procedures so that everyone was on the same page. There was a lack of clarity uh, and <coughs> procedures that were able to be not able to be clearly followed. And so this is something that we think is going to be beneficial to have it going in a uh, predictable manner in terms of what, what is the law. Thank you. Can, can I just have a follow up to that as, as well? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Senator Lyons and uh, Representative Wood and I have had the opportunity to sit down with uh, the federal court folks uh, in Burlington. Uh, uh, Judge Rice has really been uh, pushing this, but it was also the defender, the uh, U.S. prosecutor. Uh, there, there were a number of individuals from the administration uh, and Dr. Levine, uh, the one uh, missing, uh, I didn't notice that there was anybody from our state court system. And, and I, it seems like, and, and this was a, a meeting talking about really the duration of uh, addiction, uh, substance abuse or substance use uh, recovery. Uh, and, and really, it, it, they're really trying to push on uh, and looking at ways and, and center lines knows the details of much more. I was a little bit out of my uh, jurisdiction there, or maybe not that, but certainly out of my knowledge base. Uh, but but I think that was an important effort that they're really pushing that hopefully our st state courts can uh, coordinate and be be part of that. That might help this along if hopefully center lines can uh, weigh in on this a little bit further. Well, well it, and really it um, it relates to our recovery centers and the and the bill that we passed relating to recovery centers and getting some systemic improvements there, some connections between um, the courts uh, and between referral, uh, medical referral and uh, recovery centers. So there's a, there, th we're at the bottom beginning stages, I would say, 
of this work, but it was a really good meeting. Uh, and it would be helpful to, to have the courts involved in that here, uh, more involved, our state courts, because we were really talking with fed, at the federal level. So my understanding is that Judge Novotny, who is going to be the backup treatment court judge up in Chittenden County, uh, has been re has uh, now had an opportunity to reach out with the, the individuals, uh, Judge Rice and others from that. Okay. And uh, as you know, I know Representative Milan knows this very well because he, he was pushing us to more judges, more judges, and we agreed. Uh, we think it's very beneficial, but one of our plans is to have the statewide treatment court judge who's going to oversee all the treatment courts. And Judge Griffin was put into that position, and so uh, I was in touch with Judge Novotny last week, and the plan would be to have Judge Griffin uh, circle back with Judge Rice and others in that group because uh, we think it would be beneficial for him uh, and or Judge uh, Novotny to be involved. <coughs> so I, I do agree that it's important for us to have a seat at that table. Any other questions? Thank you, Martin, for reminding me and us of that. It was good. Thank you very much. Have a great day and a wonderful yes. summer, everyone. Yeah. Enjoy, enjoy your trip back. Oh, yeah. Enjoy your drive back up to Maine. I will do that. I will do that. Thank you. I hope you get to stay up there for a while. It'll be until Sunday. And then, oh, and then you're back home. We'll be back. Thank you. Have a great enjoy. day. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Amy. Yes. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to put on our Justice Reinvestment 2 hat. We have Amy Pope from uh, Joint Fiscal Office. Um, and I think we do have a handout as well. This long, this big handout. Yes. I'm um, I'm just trying to understand how much money over the last couple of years has gone into justice reinvestment um, and where it has gone. And that just sort of lays a foundation for us to start understanding justice reinvestment. And then when we get all the reports that we're supposed to be getting with all this data uh, in the fall, then maybe we can co you know, um, connect all the dots and see if where we're putting the money in is getting the results that we want. And if it's not getting the result that we want, what do we need to do to change? Either the money goes somewhere else, or we need to approach, approach it a little differently. So, um, Amy, welcome. If you could identify yourself for the record. Yes, uh, Amy Pope um, with the Joint Fiscal Office. And let's see if I can share my screen. The, um, whoops, I just logged out, sorry. Um, I, um, the, um, there is a link on um, your um, committee page that has this while I get back in here. Um, so what I did is um, you'll see sort of two sections. One says the AGO court diversion, which I'm not sure if you want to go over or if you want to focus primarily on um, the DOC sort of traditional um, justice reinvestment two is the appropriation title. Um, I would do, I would do, I would do, that's my fault, sorry. I would do the Justice Re the Department of Corrections one. Okay. Um, because the court diversion in community justice centers in terms of, of that piece is, to me, it's, it's separate from the Justice Reinvestment the purity of it in terms of <coughs> we have bed savings, you invest those savings from the beds into community programs. Okay, so I yes. thought that is what you wanted. Yeah. So I what I did is I sort of tried to focus just on my I took the spreadsheet and I just focused on primarily on DOC. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I have much to share with you except that. Um, so we have fiscal year 24, what um, was budgeted. And then in 25, there was a little bit um, additional um, 
appropriations that was provided, uh, $300,000 was added um, to Justice Reinvestment, and then we provided another, like, 3%. Yes? Do you have a no, question? No, oh. just... So there's a couple of components to this. So the first piece um, is the money that's going out to the providers. And so that's what you're seeing right here is by each, by each provider. And then um, if you go down a little bit on the bottom, I have sort of where some of the other funds, there's um, some money for tra um, transitional housing. There's a general, um, <coughs> general fund and a global commitment. And then there's a little additional funds for the Vermont network. Um, and there's additional funds um, that the um, council identified for the Vermont network as well. So my work on my case yeah. was the 900,000 is what we have carved out and we've worked with Representative Squirrel, Trevor Squirrel on this. 900,000 comes out of basically DOC's budget that would go towards our community partners for justice reinvestment. And that basically goes to the network and transitional housing. It does not go all the time. Sometimes it was a one-time thing that it went to our community justice centers, but that's not the normal path for the money. The money from justice reinvestment each year is about 900,000. Yes. And where those dollars go, yep and what services we get and how effective that is in continuing our goal of, of keeping folks out of an incarcerated bed. Yes, so the, from my understanding, the council provided a memo um, and of the 900,000, maybe 500 or 600,000 was identified and that's in this column here which um, counts where it says the CJRC includes one-time funds. <clears throat> um, so, so that's under council, right? Yep. Yes. Martin? Y yeah, I guess I just, I, I don't entirely agree with uh, what, what you just uh, had said, Alice, because I'm looking at, I'm looking at uh, Act 40, S14, and and from what I understand, it says uh, when I'm looking at it is the, the funding. One of the things that this group is looks at is the funding for utilization by individuals served through justice reinvestment to and related initiatives, including uh, agencies, departments, municipalities, programs and services employing restorative justice principles, including community justice centers. So I think community justice centers can be part of what uh -huh. funds are coming coming out of this. So when we first started with justice reinvestment it was based on bed savings in our out-of-state bed contracts. Okay. Yeah. So the first year was pretty minimal, it was like maybe three or four hundred thousand. And then the second year it bumped up to over a million dollars that we had to figure out where we were going to put it. And we divided that up between, I'm trying to remember, there was transitional housing, there was the network, and there was this one-time infusion to help um, our C CJCs. And then we negotiated with DOC, it was Appropriations Committee, I think, um, Representative Dolan, Karen Dolan from your committee, and maybe a member or so from my committee, we figured out that on a yearly basis it would be 900,000 coming out of DOC's budget for JR, for uh, justice reinvestment. Instead of looking at the out-of-state bed contract, we carved out that 900,000. And then that kind of all got lumped into, in the budget, the line item we put in justice reinvestment line item in the state budget, but we also brought in previous monies that would go towards the community justice centers as well. So I guess I'm just thinking of that actual 900,000 because that was initially new money to what's already 
in the pipeline for justice centers and all the other initiatives. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying that that's where the money goes, but it is one of the categories uh, that can be considered uh, okay. from looking at, uh, at Act 40. And to provide context on that, because there was so much confusion when we were doing this two years ago about what justice reinvestment actually was, because some people talk about it in a broader sense than just those four subject areas of transitional housing, uh, the network, and the other two escaping. Um, and so what it was was almost a redefinition of it. That's why CJCs and the providers themselves were sort of included in that initiative because the council was established to take sort of more of a holistic view of sort of the restorative justice system in the state. Whereas the council of state governments kind of looked at it with these four areas. So they wanted to roll <laughs> CJCs into sort of what a lot of people thought J justice reinvestment was anyway. So hopefully it didn't further complicate it even more, but it just rolled in initiatives that were commonly talked about within the justice reinvestment realm, if that makes sense. So the whole goal of all of this is how effective are these services and programs being in keeping people out of an incarcerated bed. That's the goal. Because we have a lot of initiatives going on that were already going on, and then we put in justice reinvestment too into those initiatives. And I'm specifically for justice reinvestment too is that 900,000 that gets added on to everything else that's already been Right, and if, if memory serves, that $900,000 was sort of what the commissioner and the department agreed that they could go up to, mm -hmm. but I, I think there was conventional wisdom that it really wasn't ever going to reach that $900,000. I think it was going to be somewhere around the four to 500 range. Um, but ultimately, there's a recommend of up to that amount, but the commissioner can do, do what what, 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 <clears throat> whatever he wants. Chair Emmons, may I speak? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Trevor. Uh, yeah, I, this continues to be confusing because when we did set this up a couple of years ago, uh, 338.1, uh, we pulled all the transitional housing, the current funding for CJCs into and added the 900,000. As you said, we negotiated with DOC when we worked away from uh, the funding mechanism for out-of-state bed uh, savings. Uh, in FY24, there was $899,000 to play with. And uh, what happened is $108,000 uh, was appropriated to uh, DCF for the barge program. And so that continues to be encumbered. And the reason that was done is that we under the new 1115 waiver that was negotiated with CMS and, and AHS, uh, but uh, barge activities uh, were, uh, were able to draw down global commitment funds. So it ended up uh, not turning that 109,000 into 250,000. So that was encumbered going into FY25. Also, uh, the Senate took $300,000 of this money in FY24 and, and created base funding for the Vermont network. So that was an additional 300,000 that ended up being encumbered going into FY25. It was my suggestion to uh, various, both my our committee, uh, House Appropriations, and, and also uh, in, in my discussion with uh, Senator Sears and that side of the uh, aisle, if you will, uh, to move that out of that 900,000 and create the base funding for Vermont Network, that did not happen. So when the council got the amount of money available to make recommendations on it, it was already down 400 and uh, essentially for, uh, 300, uh, yeah, 409,000. So we had about 490,000 to make a recommendation to, uh, for a request and, and 131,000 went to uh, reentry programming and 
uh, the 359,000 went to the community justice centers, which was added to 300,000, which actually made the, according to the community justice centers whole for FY25. But my sense is that while well, this, the 131 and the 359 is one time funding, uh, I just think this is going to need a, a whole nother set of discussion and conversation. Uh, as we go into the next year and how we want to structure this and whether we want to get back to sort of the ability to year to year utilize that $900,000 or dare I say, you know, special projects or, or maybe some, uh, some new things that, it, that are other states may be doing that we may want to take a look at. So I think a conversation for coordinated justice uh, reform advisory council, but also for the committees of jurisdiction. So it's going to, so it's really difficult to follow the money. That's what it comes down to. It's really difficult to follow the money, where it's going, what it's being used for, and is it having a positive impact in keeping people out of jail, which was the total goal. And we keep going round and round and round on this with justice reinvestment. In theory, you take your savings from not using that bed and you invest those dollars into programs in the community <coughs> that provide wraparound services to folks. That's the theory. Sure. Yeah. I, I think your point is well taken, but a lot of the discussion over the past two years about this is the need to transition away from what was being done and you know to what representative squirrel just said you know it requires a discussion with the advisory council and then a continuation of that um it, during the next session but you know it really i think the, the council was envisioned to be sort of the starting point of you have all the stakeholders in the same room and say okay this is the next phase and evolution of the system and that could include funding of the system and then maybe make a recommendation in their report come you know September and then later November um, or November rather and then that could be the the committees of jurisdiction kind of could kind of take off and run with any recommendations with that so it's gonna be I think it, it's a slow and painful evolution I, I think would be a good way to describe it well I think I just to jump in as well is I think part of the problem is that uh, some of these organizations and some of these functions like the CJCs, the network, uh, have on an annual basis been underfunded, and we're looking to this fund to backfill that, and, and it's not workable long term. Um, you know, I think we need to continue to look at you know, funding those entities appropriately and then using this fund for the purposes that Trevor just said, which is looking at one-time spending, one-time projects, uh, and the like, but we're not there yet. Um, so, I think you're absolutely right, Martin, because I, I know with um, both the network <clears throat> and even the CJCs, this was this past session, where they had an infusion in the previous session, and they were expecting to get it again this time around when we were here in session this last time they expected to get the same amount they didn't see it as one time and we were seeing it as one time just to kind of give them that one year boost and I think you're absolutely right the issue is we're not fully funding them to begin with and we're using justice reinvestment as a way to backfill yeah we're using band-aids on on what I I consider really important services uh that these entities are providing that in fact are keeping people uh mm -hmm. out of prison as well so so I don't know where to go from with this I just I don't know Should we put this definitely on our agenda uh, for further discussion on, on how this <clears throat> coordinated justice reform advisory council is working? Who was on that council? I know that came out of your committee, Martin, and working in that. Uh, one. Yeah. No, yeah. Do you know who's on the council? Uh, yeah, yeah, Trevor, Trevor is on the council. Or do you want to know the other people who are on it? 
Reverend now myself, Jean. myself and Senator Sears were on that, and then a collection of other stakeholders, such as the CJC's, Vermont Network, uh, Judiciary, uh, uh, Racial Equity Office. Uh, I'm probably missing a few folks in there, but uh, we'll Correct. be meeting. We'll, yeah, we'll be meeting, and uh, I, I can carry some of this conversation discussion into that next meeting, and 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 part of our reporting requirements or process, you know, we can make some recommendations around that too. Uh, as I said before, I think it's something that's going to carry into the next legislative session. Who's the leader? The, so the, um, I believe the chief judge is the, Judge Zoni is the, um, yeah, is the chair or whoever, someone he designates. Um, but I, I, I believe last report he was listed as the chair. And the members of the committee are the attorney general or designee with experience in community and restorative justice, the chief judge, commissioner of corrections, commissioner of uh, DCF, uh, the executive director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, the executive director of the Vermont Statistical Analysis Center, that's uh, the crime research group, um, the executive director of Office of Racial Equity, and then uh, Representative Squirrel, and then formerly Senator Sears. So, Trevor, for us to get a better understanding of this, like what Martin was saying, well, maybe we ought to schedule some time um, to do to look at this further <clears throat> and understand it better. Would this be something that we would do more in September, October? November meeting so that we have a better understanding of where the council is headed for next session. Would it be better to wait till then? It works for me. I mean, that's fine. What do you think, Martin? I just don't want to have them come in just for the sake of coming in and then we don't know what we're going to be looking at. No, I think that makes sense. And the, they make their first recommend to the commissioner of their budget by September 1. So maybe after that initial recommendation. In September, October. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, Amy, I think that's where we're going to head. So that's a good segue, I think, for us as a committee in terms of what, what are some of the thoughts <clears throat> that we want for future uh, meetings and also kind of the time frame I'd like to get what days of the week do not work for people um, so that when we send out a doodle poll, we won't include those days of the week for that. Um, so what I have gotten down so far just for today is a review of the pretrial program and um, we need to make a recommendation in terms of the $687,000 where that's going to go. That needs to occur in August and then we need uh, an understanding of earn time so that we can figure out do we expand it to parolees, do we expand it to like education credits if they're doing an educational program, do they get additional earned time? Um, Keisha brought up the issue and she was sending us an email that came that Dick Sears had <coughs> um, concern that some of the sentences may be too long um, based on what the crime they were convicted of. She was going to send that. She may have already sent it. I just haven't seen it. So, so can I just ask a quick question on that to understand yeah. that? Is it that the sentences that are that are being imposed, or the maximum sentence in statute? I don't know. Keisha brought this up, and she was going to send the email to us that she and Dick had. I think it was an email from Dick that she had. Okay. She, she was going to find it, and then she was going to send it to all of us. So just on, on that issue, then, uh, as folks may recall, 
Last biennium, uh, the House passed uh, three bills to restructure the criminal code, and it dealt with sentence lengths to try to rationalize the length of sentences across different kinds of uh, crimes. I guess uh, Bob would have been in uh, the House Judiciary at the time. Uh, and it didn't actually make it through the Senate. Uh, they just didn't get time. It timed out for them to look at those three bills. So mm -hmm. that may be something worth considering in that context. Let's, but let's see what uh, that email from uh, Senator Sears is first. But I just flag that, that there's been a significant amount of work that was done last biennium. And actually, the biennium before that, uh, we passed a bill out to start this process in, in the Senate uh, timed out on that one as well. So, so I'm going to depend on you, <clears throat> Malcolm, to kind of follow up on that, depending on when we get the email from Keisha. Yeah, sounds okay. good. Um, we also wanted some updates on the women's facility. Um, the new one updates and direction on that. that. That's really critical. That's at the top of my list. So we could do something like that in August. Maybe. Yeah, maybe there's stuff happening in August. Yeah, yeah August not first. But I won't, we won't meet until the end of August. Well, I good. was thinking, um, Alice, um, we could put facilities together. We could talk about the women's prison, the juvenile facility, and where that is. Um, and then does it make sense to have a continuing conversation on transitional housing or is that something that you think would come later? That would be later. Yeah, okay. For facilities would be the women's facility, <clears throat> the juvenile facility, and I would also include the secure residential. Yeah. Because there needs to be updates inside that well, building. Right, River Valley. Yeah. Um, that we can do next month, whenever we meet. And then um, I know that there's concern about health care. There's concern about <clears throat> trying to look at the WellPath contract um, yep. and how all of this is connected with Medicaid, 1115 waiver, DIVA, the whole nine yards. Well, it would be interesting to hear from um, DOC and Wellcraft, obviously, but it would it would be good to know exactly how what our expenditures are for the contract, and then any other additional expenditures with, you know, special services. Are there is there anything additional that we're seeing with hospital services or others, and then. For if FDOC we were, folks, right? Yes, yes. And then um, remember when Annie Romanescu gave us an estimate of the total cost, how much yeah. it would cost us if we were going to pay for a care outside of a contract, like having it administered through DIVA but not be Medicaid. Uh, that would be an interesting conversation. It's something my committee never got to, but at least we could begin a conversation with between DIVA and DOC. Okay. So you're saying if we provided, instead of contracting out with a private entity to provide our medical and mental health services to do it in-house, we talked mm -hmm. about that last year, here in yes. Justice, DOC said it would cost about 80 to 100 million. That's that right. That's what they said. There were questions that we brought up, some members, <clears throat> I think Jenny was leading this, in terms of well, have you reached out with our partners, be it DIVA, to provide some of these services? There could be other money someplace else. It doesn't have to come out of DOC's budget to provide it. That's what you're getting at, right, Jenny? Trying to sort that out, exactly. And that may not be something that we can do, but we might at least get to um, the questions that need to be asked in, in uh, our regular committees. So the, the, that's what I've got. Yeah. How about, um, as a consideration, defense attorneys or 
actual people, individuals that came out of incarceration. Find mm -hmm. out from them how that transition took place. Okay. Um, in order to understand what you're saying, then what we should do is do an update on 876. Okay. In terms of what we put in for transition reentry. We should do we should do that so that the committee understands what we put in place this past session for when folks are re-entering. Do you want to tie that with maybe the earn time intro since it's all part of that bill? Sure. Sure. But Tarper wants to also hear from folks who have actually been incarcerated <coughs> and transitioned out. I want to find out from their point of view what happened. Because people can tell us all day, what we're doing this, we're doing that. Let's find out, right. did that really happen? I'm trying to find, I'm trying to think, what's the best way to reach out, find those folks? That's, what, that's why I mentioned defense attorneys. You know, people that were defending them, maybe they, like, like for instance, when the judge says, we would talk to the attorneys and figure out how to get that done. So they might know, was that a smooth transition or was it not? Is it any better than it was? Because from what I can understand, um, it's pretty poor, or was. Potentially prisoners rights within the Defender General's office. Yeah, that might be a good starting office. point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if you can there's a fellow named John, <coughs> John Elwell, I think. Yeah, he, it's Wendy's, Wendy Harrison's son. Okay. He was, he was, uh, I thought he testified once. He did. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was, there's, yeah, he did. There's advocacy groups. That was just mm -hmm. justice. Yeah, okay. Uh, for that. Um, let's see what we can find. It might not be next meeting, it'll probably be more in September. Well, you know, there's a, there's a couple of things that we, the uh, recommendations due to the Department of Corrections. The pre-trial supervision. Pre -trial, yeah, that's, that, uh, that's coming up quick. The pre-trial supervision. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's next month. Yeah, it's next month. Yeah, we've got that. And raise the age. Yeah, but that's just a report to this committee. Yeah. yeah. And that's at the end of July. So, so, yeah, so, yeah, if you want to discuss it, we would be at the obvious Yeah, meeting. we can figure out agenda wise what's priority, but what are some of the other items that folks would be interested in? Anything besides what we just talked about? Yeah, can I uh, hit yeah. on one, a couple? Um, so, the, there's a, a push by, not a push, uh, an interest, certain certainly. Uh, by RDAP, uh, which I'm not going to try to uh, say their whole, uh, what their acronym stands for, but it's Racial, racial uh, Disparities in Juvenile Justice. Uh, and and uh, so they're, they're looking into uh, something that uh, the Office of Racial Equity has been working on uh, and is using in the administration, and it's a, an equity assessment impact tool and I do understand that RDAP may be uh, pushing uh, the legislature to be using this tool when considering uh, legislation as part of our process. Uh, and it might be it might be helpful to uh, for us to understand that in the context of the uh, legislation that uh, that we deal with in the area of uh, criminal justice and and corrections and such. Uh, I would suggest reaching out to uh probably the office of racial equity uh but also uh professor Aton Nezrad and Longo of RDAP uh as a possibility for them to explain what uh they're pushing on that actually drafted a bill last session that would have required those impact statements before any law was passed in the state so I can right right yes there's there's that kind of legislation but there could also be 
something short of actually having to bill for that requirement, but we should understand. Uh, I think it's it, it's something that uh, we're trying to pay more attention to as well in, in House Judiciary, but it may be worth a uh, while to hear from them. Uh, if nothing else, hearing from RDAP, uh, which I know we did last year, we had uh, had them in for 10, 15 minutes to give us an update. I think that that would be helpful. Um, sure. The other thing I had is, that, and I, I understand that we're going to be doing this anyway, because we're going to be expecting the report at the end of July, but I didn't hear any talk about the uh, raise the age reports. And uh, I really want to keep the heat on the administration. If nothing, if for no other reason mm -hmm. that this was kind of could be a parting gift to the memory of, uh, of Senator Sears, because this is something he has been pushing for the last number of years. And I do not want to see it extend past April of next year, which is the date that it, it started. And my shorter term goal in just keeping the heat on is to be set up to understand what uh, DCF should be asking of the legislature when we come to the budget adjustment and what kind of resources they're going to need to actually be ready uh, in April uh, for that uh, further implementation of Raise the Age. We should do that at our next meeting, possible. Yeah, I would keep that on for every meeting that we've had every other month, at least, uh, when we get an updated report each time. And, and I don't know if it's appropriate with that kind of uh, interim goal of the Budget Adjustment Act, uh, but I think that that's a good thing to, to, uh, for us to keep our eyes on because, um, yeah. you know, sometimes uh, an administration will not provide the funds necessary to do what's necessary. That's right. That's right. And that also ties in a little bit with um, the new construction of the juvenile facility. It ties in with that. you got to get those beds up. Right. You know, that was something the administration said was almost a prerequisite to mm -hmm. raise the age was getting the facility going. Yeah. So that would be good to because if we do the update on the facilities and our August meeting, we can also have this because we need this report to There's also the criminal ceiling stuff. So uh, Alice, I'm wondering if um no, just Can knowing where the negotiations are right now with the um for the citing the women's prison and then also with the juvenile mm -hmm. facility i'm wondering if having a uh, having it in september might provide for a more um information and a more robust discussion but uh, um, i guess i leave it to all of us to think about that so that's going to lead into let's Let's figure out, do we want, we're entitled for six meetings. Um, do we want to try to have a meeting towards the end of August? I'm not thinking middle of August, I'm thinking towards the end of August. Um, or do we bump that to the 1st of September? Um, I think by, by the end of August, beginning of September, we have a better idea about the women's facility. Right? Better than today. Better than today. But there may be some meetings that are occurring between now and the middle of August that might help for clarity. Or not. But no decisions made. Hmm? But no decisions made. No decisions so going to be made for a while. I'm going to be able to speak specifically about it. Um, what are people thinking for when we should meet <clears throat> next time? So if we have one at the beginning of September, we have second one, October, November, December, that gives us five meetings. We can have six, right? We can have six meetings total. Well, this is the six, is this the sixth? No. This is one? Yeah. Okay. So if you did in September, it'd be our second, September, October, November, December. So what are people thinking? It's just hard for some of those elections. It doesn't that give us six? Mm -hmm. This is our first meeting. If we do one at the beginning of September, 
September, October, November, December. Well, we could do it the 21st or the 28th of uh, August, but then. Um, and then you're kicking it down to the end of September. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get all six of them with everything you're adding on to this year. Do we meet we in do June? Or no. We do. We do, and that would mean, if we don't meet no. at the end of August, what it means is <clears throat> we're going to end up having two meetings sometime. We do the last one. Yeah. You know, it'll be sometime in November. But, but this is an election season, so things are going to get crazy. Come on. <laughs> well, we get that. I mean, you could do it after November 6th. Okay. Yeah. He may not lose around the table. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, we're all okay. The 28th of August is pretty close to September. That might relieve some pressure. If we had it the 28th of August, then you'd have another one towards the end of September. Yeah. How does Wednesday, August 28th work for people? Right now, it sounds good. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows is definitely right for well, me. You, I think I know. I'm right. thinking about Keisha. Right. That's right. Keisha, oh, you're in a different world. world. Okay. <laughs> as long as everybody knows that, I'll make it when I can. And and I'm August twenty eighth works for me, certainly. It does work. Yes. So let's let's plan for the twenty eighth. I think it's enough time to maybe appoint an eighth member. Yeah. Um, and then we can anticipate something towards the end of September. And <laughs> shoot, Teresa Wood just texted me and said, for some reason, today's meeting did not register on her calendar. <laughs> she was. I was like, where's Teresa? Because I knew she could make it. Um, the issue is going to be October may be a little dicey because it's so close to the election. But let's do August 28th, and then we'll go from there. We will, um, Megan, Ben, and I will work up an agenda. It would be nice to get some updates on the facilities, but we don't know if we're going to be able to do something. And get some background information on earn time, get the background information on food child supervision, and the background information on the medical part. And you want then, me to do that, so hmm? do you want me to do yeah, that? Yeah, you could do that. So are you available on the 28th? I am available on the 28th. Okay. Keep working. He, he's in check. Oh, Megan's available on the 28th. Okay. So we're just going to schedule then. Yeah. Yeah, schedule the 28th. August. August 28th. Period. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. We're going to meet, and then we're going to work up on the schedule. Yeah, we got one more thing to do before we leave. We've got to figure out the leadership. Okay, let me make a motion when we get that over. Well, let oh, me, wait a minute. I have a, I've got an update because I, I checked the resolution. So on the voting part, everybody who's remote, you can revoke, vote up to three times for any reason, so you're good. Um, and that's a per committee, so this won't count against any other committee that may be here on um, and remotely voting on during the summer as well. But after discussion with both the, the House Clerk's Office and the Senate Secretary's Office, um, we all thought that the cleanest way that would be complying with the statute, with the, which demands that the, the, the chair rotates, is to leave the chair position vacant and have Representative Evans operate as the chair, as acting chair in her position as vice chair, and then just elect a clerk, which is supposed to be elected anyway, to sort of be the fill-in um, if, for whatever reason, Representative Benz is unavailable for a meeting. Um, stay away from terms like interim um, and, and things of that nature. Um, so the, the, the legal minds, if you will, thought that that would be the cleanest solution. So keep the chairmanship position, vacant. keep it open, vacant. Have me as vice chair in charge, and then we elect a clerk, and the clerk would be the person that would give back up to the vice chair. That is my motion. 
And who would do the work? <laughs> Jenny. Jenny. Uh, okay. That, work? that works. That's good. It, isn't well, the motion we need is to have a, a motion to have Jenny uh, Lines be the clerk? I don't yes. know that. Yeah, that's really all we have. Yeah. So it would just be the, <clears throat> the Jenny Lyons will be the clerk. Okay. You want to get out of here. <laughs> any discussion? <laughs> any, any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. aye. aye. Those. Okay. It does pass unanimously. We solved this. It took us all day to do it. <laughs> Welcome aboard, Jenny. All right. Uh, don't expect any minutes from me. <laughs> no, but we'll be in contact, Jenny, myself, Ben, and Megan will talk about the agenda for sure. August. Good. As soon as we get that done, we'll ship it out. Anything else before we finish up? Move to adjourn. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're done. Second. Second. Thank you. We're done.